In these times, it is wrong to receive extraordinary record revenues and profits benefiting from war and on the back of our consumers. Our proposal will raise more than 140 billion euros for member states to cushion the blow directly. Ursula von der Leyen there at the European Commission just a bit earlier today. She went on to talk about rounders too and how it's you know, oh, okay. formed baseball you, later on. You want me to do this? I'm joking. Okay. Equities Mayor are up Culper. a half of 1% on the right. S&P. I would that's suggest right. that we're firmer by a half of one percent, also, Tom. John, I would suggest <laughs> Van der Leyen is the former defense minister of Germany, is encyclopedic on Germany's ability to help Ukraine. Yeah, it's something people I, don't know. I, She's I agree. encyclopedic. Also, in, encyclopedic truly on, on encyclopedic. the mistakes yes. that have been made. Yes, but she's truly encyclopedic on their uh, military ability. Oksana Aronoff back with us for a final word over at JP Morgan. Oksana, on Europe, we've had a lot of guests on the program, and they approach the situation in Europe as follows, not if there'll be a recession, how deep it will be. Do you have the same approach right now? Yes, definitely. Europe, of course, is dealing with um, issues that the U.S. is somewhat insulated from. You know, we talk about energy and how energy has led up here in the U.S., for example, but European gas prices are on the rise again. Um, and so, uh, without a doubt, uh, there is definitely a lot of focus on how deep uh, that recession will end up being. And we're seeing it in investors being, you know, to the extent they're underweight, equities are really majorly underweight, um, European equities specifically, right, and much, much less so in the U.S. They're essentially flat um, in terms of their U.S. equity <coughs> exposure. So, uh, without a doubt, the issues there are uh, much more significant. We're seeing it in um, higher um, spreads, slightly more elevated spreads, um, lower returns year to date. So, absolutely. Right. What's your visibility to 2023? I'm fascinated by the September reset. It's way too early to talk about a year-end review. But do you have any view, Oksana, to how to invest into 2023, or are you just making it up as you go? I will tell you one thing. I take a lot of issue with what the market is pricing in for next year, which is nothing other than the Fed making a U-turn and becoming accommodative. And it is um, quite clear to me that the Fed is going to pursue its aggressive stance. Investors are making ESG investments neutral, with the same bottom line driven focus as their other investors are reflecting right now. Someone earlier mentioned our last hiking cycle, the 2015-2018, which was extraordinarily benign. We had inflation at barely 2%. We had higher unemployment. And still, we had, for example, you know, lower credit spreads after the last that hike back then were in the high 500s, 575, if I remember correctly. And today, you know, when someone talks about fair value and credit, what's really, what's fair value right now? High yield is pricing significantly below 20-year average. Forget, you know, 20-year recession average. So I think yeah. there is definitely a lot of complacency since still being placed into this market, being priced into this market. And we need to really be focused on high-quality floating rate, um, very short, uh, but floating rate preferably, um, and really wait for that capitulation point. That will be my tip-off to start to really get more aggressive. Just to put a bow on this, Oksana, how much of your portfolio is in cash-like instruments, and how much have you been building that? So we came into the year already quite defensively positioned, and we've been building it throughout the year. Yes, we've been tactically trading, you know, the curve and taking advantage of the backup in yields at the front end of the curve. But as far as sort of more strategic, you know, allocation to longer-term risk in the interest rate-driven or credit-driven markets, we've really tried to stay back and actually build our liquidity. Um, we are still, um, or actually have arrived now at around 70% liquidity, which is, you know, focused again on those high-quality floating rate structures. Um, and we think that that capitulation point will happen. We're just starting to see markets reckon with the reality that this Fed means what it said, with the reality that higher cost of capital is not going to be great for fundamentals. And even this is really important to understand that we don't need to see you know, a 2008 or some kind of dramatic recession occur. We just need to see historic defaults or defaults start to move towards historic <laughs> average in the corporate sector of 3.5%. Right now, they're at 1 to start to see those spreads widen dramatically compared to where they are today. Oksana, you need to let us know when you're ready to put that cash to work because we need to cash out when we get to that moment. Oksana Aronoff at J.P. Morgan, Tom. In fancy talk, John, 70% liquidity, floating rate, She's on the edge of the triple leveraged all cash fund. I would say that was yeah. pretty, pretty, yeah. pretty gloomy, pretty bearish. Yeah. I have to I mean, say. 
That's a lot of cash, Bramo. 70% liquidity. At what yeah. point do they get the, the, the conviction to deploy, I think, is the right <clears throat> question. 30 minutes ago, the late Queen making the final journey from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall. Lizzie Burden's back with us from Abington Green. Lizzie, walk us through the next couple of minutes. Well, the Queen's coffin is making its way from Buckingham Palace to the Palace of Westminster. Uh, it's already been down Pall Mall, a horse guards parade. It's approaching Whitehall really places to people outside the UK perhaps just names on the Monopoly board but this is the Queen showing her old adage uh, to, she needs to be seen to be believed uh, the, the, the coffin's going to arrive at Westminster Hall and it will be she'll lie in state until Monday when the funeral happens uh, and people are going to be able to file past and pay their respects they've been queuing for days overnight despite the rain despite the warnings of a 30 hour a queue, uh, but really, this is the magic of monarchy, isn't it? The the king is going to uh, begin his reign with this sharing of the national outpouring of grief. Uh, you've got this king and. Uh, flanked by his uh, children, his siblings, on foot behind yeah. the coffin. Uh, it really is a, <clears throat> a, a, a symbolic moment, and it evokes the memory of when Charles and William, uh, when William and Harry right. walked behind their own mother's coffin 25 years ago. Lizzie, I, I, I would say the imagery right now, and for those of you on radio, it is as you would expect, except we're seeing generational imagery. This is really the first time, Lizzie, We've seen the generations of her descendants I together. Hear and I couldn't hear anything. I think we're having technical problems. Okay, I think thank you. We've lost Lizzie Burden. That happens. From Abington Green. With 400,000 people there, that can happen. Uh, so, Tom, a deeply emotional moment for this country. The Queen's coffin making its way to Westminster Hall, followed on foot by senior royals, the royal family, including the King for that matter as well. Tom, as I mentioned a little bit earlier this morning, this walk from Buckingham Palace up the mall, through Horse Guards Parade, through the Horse Guards Arch, <clears throat> onwards through Whitehall, Tom, onto Westminster, right. take 15 minutes or so. This is taking about 40 and minutes, giving everyone the opportunity to pay their respects as the Queen makes that final journey, Tom, to Westminster Hall. And the compression here, John, I think for so many, particularly in America, including myself, we don't understand how all of this bureaucracy of government over centuries is all compressed into this square mile. So where they're going through, through Whitehall at the moment, Tom, they are the offices of government. And then on to Westminster and the House of Parliament and the buildings that you're so familiar with. Lisa, we did this walk together just on Sunday mornings, I've said a couple of times already. It is the final journey of this Queen to Westminster Hall where she will lie in state for five days from today through to Monday morning. The opportunity for this country to pay its final respects to the late Queen, Elizabeth II. satellites have propulsion systems they can kind of move to get out of the way of each other or, or change their orbit a little bit it's a service that you guys offer to help these companies know how to maneuver their machines yeah we offer a collision avoidance service it's a subscription service we'll send you an alert up to seven days in advance 
if your satellite's going to come dangerously close to a piece of debris or another satellite. Companies have been doing that for decades, moving satellites around, but it's, it's sort of like a harder problem now. The risk of a collision is a lot higher now, just because we've installed so much more hardware into space. You have a big collision, it creates a cloud of debris, and now all the other satellites are flying through this whizzing mess uh, of debris. As we add all of the new satellites into space, the risks of the collision, the likelihood of the collision is going up. money and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chan. Weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York and 2 p.m. in San Francisco. combines the latest in AI-powered tools and in-depth analysis to accelerate the research process. To grow your practice and make better use of your valuable time. The difference is Bloomberg Law. Pepsi's number fever campaign in the Philippines has probably gone down in history as one of the biggest marketing disasters in history, mainly because of a human error that led Pepsi to print more winning caps than they planned. The resulting chaos caused riots, civil unrest, and even deaths. Reporting this story took over a year and it resulted in me flying uh, to Manila in the Philippines to meet unlucky winners and to find out exactly what happened back then in the 1990s. My name is Jeff Maish. I'm a journalist based in Los Angeles. I wrote the story for Bloomberg Business Week about Pepsi's number fever campaign. The Philippines is a really interesting country. It's made up of thousands of islands. And it's also a country that's very heavily influenced by America. American culture is everywhere you look in the Philippines. They're obsessed with Frank Sinatra music, for example. They love all things America, and that extends to their, their love for soft drinks, Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola. In the 1990s, it was everywhere. Pepsi and Coca-Cola were embroiled in what is now known as the Cola Wars. It was a fierce battle for market dominance. Number Fever was already a really popular promotion. It had been rolled out in America to great success. And so Pepsi decided to roll it out internationally, particularly in Asia. They thought it was the answer to their problems. They thought it could finally help them beat their biggest competitor. A million pesos, or six to eight thousand dollars, doesn't sound like a lot now, but in 1992, that was a phenomenal amount of money. You've got to remember that in the Philippines at the time, the average monthly income was about a hundred dollars, so a million pesos was wealth beyond anyone's wildest imaginations. Number Fever caught fire in the Philippines. Kids were saving up their pocket money to buy a bottle of Pepsi. Parents were squirreling away all of the bottle caps in bags. You would walk down the street and people were going through trash trying to find discarded bottle caps. It was a national phenomenon. 
Pepsi boasted that half the population of the Philippines was playing it. Number Fever boosted Pepsi's sales every month from $10 million to $14 million. It had a huge impact on Pepsi's bottom line. Number Fever quickly became Number Hysteria. Maids were being jailed for stealing their employers' winning bottle caps. There was even some murders uh, over, over winning bottle caps. People were fighting in the streets uh, over these caps. There were signs that there were going to be problems with Number Fever very early. Pepsi had rolled out the competition in Chile and a garbled fax had caused some kind of problem with the winning number. They'd announced the wrong one in Chile, causing riots. There were signs that there could be big problems ahead if they didn't keep their eye on the ball. So in 1992, Pepsi decided to extend the campaign in the Philippines and they announced that the competition would go on for a few more weeks. One night, on the television news, they announced the latest winning number. 349. The problem was, 349 had already been allocated as a non winning number in earlier campaigns. So there were literally hundreds of thousands of bottle caps with 349 just floating around the Philippines. Hundreds of thousands of people all across the Philippines, thousands of islands, were finding winning bottle caps. 349, 349. Some people had 10 lucky 349 bottle caps. People were dancing in the streets, celebrating. They thought their problems were over. They were millionaires. It's still not certain exactly how many winners there were of lucky 349 bottle caps, but we know that Pepsi printed over 600,000 of them. Pepsi realized very early that there was a problem. Hundreds of people started arriving at their bottling plants with their lucky bottle caps. They realized something was seriously wrong. Pepsi tried to solve the problem by offering a small token donation to anyone that brought a lucky bottle cap to their bottling plant. But it wasn't enough. People didn't want just a handful of pesos. People wanted their million peso prize. Within a year, violent protests and riots outside Pepsi factories would leave dozens injured and five people dead. At one Pepsi factory in the Philippines, a grenade was thrown through the window. It killed three Pepsi employees. Anacita Rosario was a school teacher living near Manila in the Philippines. She was one of the tragic victims of this whole thing. She was walking to a nearby store to buy some rice one day when a Molotov cocktail was thrown at a Pepsi truck in a, in a violent protest. It bounced under the truck and exploded. It killed her and an innocent bystander who was just a child and injured many others. When I was in the Philippines, I tracked down Anacita's daughter, Cindy, and her husband, Raul. It was clear to me that they were still very upset by the whole thing. You know, a family had been ripped apart by this competition. And Raul told me that he'd never remarried. He'd uh, told me that he'd gone to meet Pepsi executives after his wife was killed. And he was angry. He, he said to them, you know, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for number fever. The biggest revelation from my reporting was rumors that Pepsi was somehow involved in bombing their own trucks. I found a newspaper report with a headline that said, Pepsi goons bomb their own trucks. And when I visited the MBI, the police uh, department in, in the Philippines, they presented me with documents and interviews with people who claimed that Pepsi had paid them to cause riots and to cause trouble outside their plants in order to destabilize the situation and to frame the owners of the coalitions uh, that, were, that were fighting them to try and curry favor. I just thought that was, that was so shocking. And of course, Pepsi denied it, but how bizarre that a company would be accused of bombing their own trucks.
The contest had sparked so much anger in the Philippines because it landed at just this really weird time in the Philippines' history. It was during a crazy election that was racked with allegations of fraud. The Philippines was in a kind of love-hate relationship with America. They loved, obviously, the American aid and finances that was pouring into the country, but at the same time, they yearned for independence. They wanted to be their own country. Vicente Del Fierro was a local preacher living in Manila, and he hated the number fever campaign. Del Fierro thought Pepsi's number fever campaign was just one of the many ways that America was asserting its dominance over a third world country. He hated seeing his fellow countrymen get ripped off in his eyes by this huge multinational American company. He wanted justice. Del Fierro rounded up over 800 winners of 349 bottle caps, and he got them all together to sue Pepsi for over $400 million to be divided between those holders of lucky bottle caps. Del Fierro took money from some of the people who could afford it. They paid him 500 pesos to help with legal fees, but for people who couldn't afford the, the money, he would just represent them pro bono. The alliance, they say, is to build up pressure on Pepsi and so you see people uh, marching in the streets. Mm -hmm. So um, we have mounted our own uh, campaign, even in the U.S., even in the U.S. He flew to America and he hired two uh, consumer lawyers uh, here in America to take on Pepsi. He had a meeting at Pepsi's headquarters to try and resolve the problem, but he said he wanted to take it all the way to the highest courts in America. When those cases were heard in America, those courts decided that this was a problem that should be heard in the Philippines, not in America. Back in the Philippines, Del Fierro continued his case in the Filipino courts. At one stage, there were arrest warrants handed out for nine Pepsi-Cola executives, which he saw as a big victory. We don't know if those arrest warrants were ever upheld, but it made newspaper headlines across the country. Pepsi did not take kindly to Del Fierro's campaign. They tried everything to shut him down. They sued him for libel. My father had to attend three times a month for a branch 145, and another hearing for the branch 138, also three times a month. Also, um, there was a time uh, my father was hospital due to heart failure. Still, he had to attend the two branch hearing otherwise, uh, for not attending the judge will issue warrant of arrest to my father. Uh, my father uh, passed away January 13, 2010. After staying for almost one year in a hospital, he died of complication due to heart failure. After the death of my father, I was inspired to do the website. PepsiCo will be remembered for what they did to the consumer in the Philippines and to my father. When I reached out to Pepsi for comment for this story, they claimed that they didn't have access to anyone who was working at Pepsi that was around in those days. They also said that during COVID-19, they didn't have access to their, their documents about this, but you know, they were, very, they were very careful to say that they were sorry for everything that happened. And we do know that Pepsi did try everything to try and make this right. The Pepsi number fever disaster cost the company millions. We know that they paid up to $10 million in those goodwill payments. But the financial effect could be much greater. After the disaster, we know that Pepsi sales dipped. They were overtaken by Coca-Cola again. Pepsi's number fever disaster changed the legacy of that soft drink in the Philippines forever. Some people of a certain age won't touch it. For many people, Pepsi is a taboo word. A lot of the people that I spoke to were still quite traumatized by their experience, by that experience of winning a million pesos, losing it, and then returning to their normal life in poverty in Manila.
When the news of the bombing came out, it was a massive story in Germany. We are following some breaking news coming to us out of Dortmund in Germany. It was covered by all the media outlets. Three roadside explosions triggered at the same time last night as the coach left its hotel in the south of Dortmund. Public figures commented on it. We should not let them affect our, our life, whoever it was. The media echo went far beyond Dortmund. I think it was front page news in every single big paper around Europe. Everyone thought of like a terrorist attack and people were scared that throughout the city in Dortmund there was more attacks to be happening. Unbeknownst to investigators, just after the bomb went off and the, the players of the team were shell-shocked, the person who had masterminded the attack was actually sitting in the hotel eating uh, steak and sweet potatoes. My name is Thomas Rogers. I'm the journalist who wrote the article, The Get Rich Quick Scheme That Nearly Killed a German Soccer Team. Dortmund is a mid-sized city in the western part of Germany in a state called North Rhine-Westphalia. And it's a former industrial city that's kind of fallen on hard times in the last few decades. It was severely bombed in the war, so the center of the city is quite stark. Some of the few high points include its soccer team. My name is Ike Henning. I'm a reporter with Bloomberg News, and I'm a great fan of Borussia Dortmund. Dortmund fans are super loyal. On all match days, the entire city is in black and yellow. It's like a religion. I think more than most German cities, uh, Soccer does play a very large role in the identity of Dortmund. In October of 2000, the uh, BBB became the first team in the Bundesliga to actually go public. Salaries for uh, soccer players in the Bundesliga have gone up very dramatically. With such high prices, they thought that by, um, by going public, they would be able to compete better with big teams like Bayern Munich. Unfortunately, that didn't go too well. Dortmund bought too many expensive players, high wages, and the club almost went bust in 2005. The, the price of their shares, uh, it has sometimes gone up, but mostly gone down since they made that decision. So on April 11th, 2017, the team was staying in a hotel on the outskirts of Dortmund. Match days are always special in Dortmund. Everyone is looking forward to it. The team always meets in the same hotel ahead of matches. They stayed in this hotel in order to have a kind of neutral space before games so that they could concentrate, be sort of isolated from distractions, things like that. Everyone was pretty optimistic. They had a chance to go really far, maybe into the finals. I was in the office and getting ready for match day. I was going to meet with a friend, a fellow Dortmund supporter in a pub. As always, the fans are very excited about matches. On that day, they were heading to play in the quarterfinal against AS Monaco at Signal Iduna Stadium, which is in the center of Dortmund. Shortly before 7 p.m., the players of the team boarded their official team bus. When the bus took off the parking lot of the hotel and turned on the street, there were three, three detonations, three bombs that exploded and hit the bus of Dortmund. Three explosions occurred close to the Borussia Dortmund team bus. The B team bus had just left the hotel. The explosions destroyed two windows in the rear part of the bus. People screamed, people jumped to the ground. The fellow Dortmund fan I was supposed to watch the match with, uh, he called me and said, turn on, turn on the TV, there was an attack on the Dortmund bus. And I thought he was like, that was impossible. Some of the players uh, screamed at the driver to keep driving as fast as possible because they were worried that people might storm the bus. German investigators say the explosive devices used in the attack on the Borussia Dortmund bus contained metal pins, and that one had pierced a seat headrest. Unbeknownst to the team members, the actual mastermind behind the attack was, as they were disembarking, the bus was actually eating steak and sweet potatoes at the hotel they had just left. Authorities are attempting to verify a letter left at the scene claiming jihadists were behind the attack. 
because there had been a series of attacks by Islamic terrorists in Germany and Europe, there was a widespread suspicion in the media that this was another Islamic uh, terror attack. Three letters were found at the site of the bombing that took credit uh, for the attack on behalf of Islamic State. There were, however, reasons to, to, to doubt this particular narrative. It would actually be a surprise um, if ISIS um, were actually um, part of this, this attack. It possibly could be um, a ploy by other groups like the far right wing to try and shift the blame. The letters had some strange qualities. They were written in a strange uh, German that used big, sophisticated words, um, but had basic grammar mistakes, as if someone was a native German speaker but pretending to be a foreign person. Federal investigators have detained one man, suspected of links to Islamist terrorism, one of two suspects whose apartments were raided this morning. Shortly after the, the bombing, uh, a, a man in Austria named Rudolf, who is a, was a big uh, BBB fan, he noticed that something strange was going on on the stock market related to the team's shares. He emailed the lawyers of BBB, who then forwarded that email on to investigators. The email stated that someone had bought 60,000 uh, BBB put options, a wager that the value of the shares of the team would fall below a certain amount at a certain date. Why would someone buy that ahead of a match and then three bombs go off, uh, something, something, something isn't right here. For the person to make money off of that, it required the stock to go down quite a bit in a fairly short period of time. And it wouldn't just be the team losing a match, it would require something much bigger than that. There was another big red flag about this purchase, which is the fact that it had actually been made, number one, on the day of the bombing, but also um, from an IP address that had been traced to the actual hotel where the bombing had taken place. When three explosions targeted the bus carrying the Borussia Dortmund footballers on April the 11th, written notes left at the scene claimed the attack was the work of ISIL. The truth, as is now alleged, is remarkable. On April 21st, the police arrested a man uh, in a southern German city called Tübingen. He was on his way to work, and his name was Sergei Benagold. He seemed like an unlikely suspect um, because he had no known connections to the uh, Islamic uh, terror world. He didn't seem like a far-right extremist. He didn't seem like a left-wing extremist either. He seemed to be a completely unremarkable young man. A 28-year-old German-Russian man, named only as Sergei W., stayed in the same hotel as the players on the night before the bombing. He specifically requested an upper room overlooking the bushes where the explosive devices were hidden. The media dissected why he would do that, what was his past. He had uh, been inspired by the 2015 terror attack in Paris. And he noticed that in the aftermath of the attack, the stocks of French companies went down. And he believed that if an attack uh, took place that was directed at a specific company, that the decrease in stock price would, for that company would be even more dramatic. It never occurred to anyone that someone would do that out of greed. We now know that the suspect bought three different derivatives on the Borsia Dortmund shares. With all these derivatives, he bet on falling shares. The suspect bought the majority of these financial products on the 11th of April, the day of the attack. If the plot had been completely successful uh, and the stock had reached a value of zero, Vaynergold would have made up to 570,000 euros, uh, or the equivalent of uh, about $608,000. Ultimately, the plan completely backfired. The attacker, Sergei Vaynergold, didn't make any money. In fact, he lost money. In court, he would be extremely he usually kept his hands clasped together. One of the lawyers actually commented that he had never seen a defendant act so calmly. Wiener Gold had served some time in the German military. From that information and from online research, he was able to figure out how to assemble remote detonated bombs that would do um, what he hoped to do. 
There were a few days of extremely emotional testimony, including the soccer players who described doubting whether or not they could ever play another game again. It brought everything back up and it didn't quite help them to kind of process what was going on. Throughout it all, he sat there completely silent. The big mystery that was swirling around the trial was the question of why he may have simply done it because he wanted to impress a woman. Rebecca is a young woman who has a very troubled home life. She ultimately sees her relationship with Vaynergold as an opportunity to leave that troubled home. Vaynergold is a Russian immigrant to Germany. He speaks with an accent. He has anxiety in large groups of Germans. She begins to resent the fact that he has these fears and feels a little bit trapped. Rebecca attempts to dump him on multiple occasions, and he threatens to commit suicide if she leaves him. Vaynergold apparently uh, told Rebecca that she would soon be seeing a surprise. After being dumped uh, via text message, uh, he apparently began planning for this attack in earnest. Vaynergold was charged with 28 counts of attempted murder, which carried a maximum sentence in Germany of life in prison. He claimed that he had nothing to do with the attack, but as time went on, he admitted that he had actually been the person who had built the explosives and had set them off. Uh, but he claimed that he didn't want to actually kill anybody. Ultimately, Vaynergold didn't receive the harshest possible sentence. Uh, he was given 14 years in prison, but it's still a considerable amount in, in jail in Germany. The threat of an asteroid hitting Earth is very real. If it's big enough, it's also very final. These are very, very infrequent events. The probability is not zero, though. A blinding flash of light streaking across the sky. About 100 tons of space rock falls on Earth every day. Most of it is so small it burns up in our atmosphere or lands unnoticed away from major populations. No human in the past thousand years is known to have been killed by a meteorite. And according to NASA, no large object is likely to strike the Earth any time in the next several hundred years. However, one thing is certain. We haven't found them all. There are thousands out there, and we don't know where they are. asteroids in our solar system. They number in the billions. Scientists all over the world are working toward detecting and deflecting the most catastrophic of natural disasters. The race is on to find as many of these objects as we can. We have a way of calculating whether or not an asteroid is potentially dangerous or not. I mean, I think it's something worth investing in. <laughs> it's our existence at stake, right? Let's get this one out of the way. It's probably the question you get asked the most, but how scared should we be? Asteroids and comets are a natural hazard that's out there, like a lot of other natural hazards. Uh, these are very, very infrequent events, these collision events, where, where an object actually impacts the Earth. The most important thing that we need to know about asteroids is you know, when the next impact is going to happen and how bad it will be. What we know is that an object that's about say, a kilometer across, is capable of causing very, very wide devastation across the planet, really, truly global devastation. 
The object that wiped out the dinosaurs was somewhere in the neighborhood of five to 10 kilometers across, so even bigger than that. At a kilometer, it's still gonna be very uh, bad and it will have global effects. For objects that are capable of causing what I would call sort of regional damage, kind of a large major metropolitan area, a city and its surrounding environments, sort of around 100-ish meters. It depends on the details of the composition and so forth. By the 1980s, NASA was cataloging near-Earth objects. In 1994, stargazers watched as comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 hit Jupiter. The resulting zone of chaos was estimated to be as large as the Earth, and the event became a turning point in the search for asteroids and comets in our solar system. In 1998, Congress tasked NASA with finding 90% of asteroids and comets one kilometer wide or larger. Soon after, Hollywood blockbusters Armageddon and Deep Impact brought attention and fear to the masses. The great news is that the vast majority, more than 90% of all the really large one kilometer near Earth objects have been found. The challenge now is working down to these smaller sizes that are still quite capable of causing a lot of damage, uh, but they're just harder to spot because they're fainter, they're smaller. Can you give us a sense of how many are out there in our solar system? We know that there are a lot of asteroids in our solar system. They number in the billions. Most of them, however, are between uh, Mars and Jupiter in what we call the main asteroid belt. This is a region of space where most of the asteroids in the inner part of our, our solar system live, and they stay there for many billions of years. There is another population, though, that kind of leaks inward and gets into the region somewhat close to the Earth and we call these near-Earth objects. We think that there are millions and millions of near-Earth objects that are out there in the total population. As of today, we know of sort of around 20, 25,000, something like that. When we first spot an object, we really know very little about it. We just see something moving across the sky. So all you get is just sort of a handful of snapshots, just enough to be able to tell that this isn't an asteroid that we've already seen before. And then once we can calculate the distance to it, we can now start to make predictions about its true size. Is it large or is it small? So we have a lot of information that we have to get pretty quickly to really understand what's going on. Finding asteroids is just one piece of the puzzle. Planetary scientists are extremely skilled in determining the orbits and speeds of asteroids based on relatively small amounts of data. NASA runs simulations of the trajectories asteroids could take, which is useful but time consuming. A team of scientists in the Netherlands have found a way that could buy us more time. Our method is very quick. So you can very quickly get an assessment of whether or not the object is dangerous or not. If you look at the classical way of determining the danger of an asteroid, it may take you know, days of computing time on very big machines to, uh, to determine this, this uh, hazardousness. The current problem is that there's just too many asteroids out there to uh, spend a huge amount of uh, computational power on all of them. So the neural network allows us to focus on what really could go and uh, pose a hazard to Earth. A neural network is a computing system that mimics the way the human brain operates to find underlying relationships in a set of data. By training the network in this way, you, you train it in recognizing those objects that are most likely to hit the planet. And once it's trained, you can apply this network to all the unknown asteroids. And then you can make a selection and say, hey, this is, these are the ones which appear to be having orbits similar to the ones which we know are hitting the planet. That doesn't mean that they do, but it, does, it only means that they look very similar to the ones we, we know they do. What else did you find? Should we be particularly concerned about anything? One thing that we did find is that um, our neural network was able to go and um, identify a handful of asteroids which weren't considered potentially hazardous, that uh, when we went and integrated them forward in time, they came uh, quite close to Earth. We find a handful which were not detected before or not considered being dangerous before, and we think they are potentially dangerous. It's very hard to simulate kind of going forward in time an asteroid that's going to hit Earth because, well, the Earth is really small and, uh, well, space is really big, and then you have to have very exact parameters to shoot an asteroid that goes and hits exactly Earth. 
And then Simon had the ingenious idea of not even trying to do that and just launching the asteroids from Earth's surface and integrating backwards in time. It's very hard to make it hit. So you need a lot of, a lot of calculations which all end up in nothing. And the idea was then like, well, let's not do that. This is basically what NASA is doing. NASA is taking an asteroid, making multiple copies of them, shooting them all forwards in time, calculating their orbits, and then see what fraction sort of gets close to Earth. Not even hitting Earth, but getting close to Earth. And then they call it a potential impactor. So you calculate the solar system forwards in time for, let's say, a thousand years. And then you launch asteroids from the surface as if they, if you go forwards in time, would fall on the surface. You calculate them backwards to today, and then you get your orbital parameters of today's asteroids, which you know will land on the planet. And those you can use as known impactors and compare with all the other asteroids in the, in the solar system. Can simulations and, and AI, can those things fill in the gaps where perhaps telescopes and, and other imaging tools can't? Absolutely. Since the observations get more complex... Uh, the physics gets more complex. And if the physics gets more complex, the mathematics becomes more complex. And at some point, you can't solve your problems analytically anymore. And then this is where the computer comes in. Now we have this trained neural network. We have a way of calculating in a fraction of a second whether or not an asteroid is potentially dangerous or not and therefore deserves more attention or, or more time to spend on uh, for, for really finding out if it is dangerous. When it comes to hunting asteroids, time is critical. What we can do about a potentially hazardous object depends a great deal on what we know about it and how much time we have before the encounter. We'd really like to find them when they're decades away. Because the more time you have, the more options you have. And the less energy it takes to, to move an object aside. It also means we might not have to resort to launching a nuclear warhead at an asteroid until recently, pretty much our only choice. That's an option of last resort, in my opinion, yes. We have lots of options available. You can just simply bump into the object and just nudge it out of the way. That's one possibility, and that's kind of, in a way, sort of the simplest thing to think about, just nudging it off its path a little bit with, you know, a massive object, a spacecraft, let's say. It's just kind of like bowling, if you will. You know, if you have a long time or a long stretch of, of runway in the lane, just a very small twist on the on the bowling ball will make a big change in where it ultimately ends up. Another option it would be something where you take a very big, big, massive spacecraft and you park it next to the object and you use the force of gravity as a towing rig. That takes longer, though, and you need to be able to send a pretty massive spacecraft, and it obviously depends a lot on how big the asteroid is. Other options start to get more and more complicated, and uh, they range from painting one side of the object a white color and painting the other side dark and then letting the pressure of light sort of perturb its orbit. In a departure from the lab and computer simulations, NASA has real plans to rehearse kinetic impact deflection. In 2021, the agency will launch DART, a double asteroid redirection test mission, which will intercept a 160 meter asteroid in 2022 better to practice now before we have to deal with an actual threat. In the meantime, discovering asteroids is our best bet. Thousands of scientists and amateur astronomers around the world make up an informal network that survey the heavens. But that may not be enough. NASA wants more resources to map our solar system and better technology. We need to ramp up our network of sensors. And also, uh, we need to just continue to strengthen our, our network of international observers so that we can get follow-up, uh, because we find these objects when they're distributed all over the night sky. Once we get more observations, we get better data, we can make better predictions. If you look at the big impactors we have had in the last, let's say, 20 years, or maybe 30 years, or 50 years, most of them we haven't seen coming. So the danger, the real danger, I think, comes from the objects we don't know about and not from the objects we do know about. This particular natural disaster, like a lot of natural disasters and like climate change, is a problem of the global commons. Uh, so the thing that we risk collectively is that it sort of then becomes nobody's problem and nobody takes ownership over it. The asteroids are all over the sky. They just truly cross boundaries and borders with a second's notice kind of imagine in the future maybe lots of small satellites around the earth that are always going and looking outward. I mean, I think it's something worth investing in. <laughs> it's our existence at stake.
right? The pandemic has affected everyone in different ways. Some pass the time by baking. Homemade sourdough bread. Do I need to say more? Some chose to binge watch Netflix. It's your game. Or maybe you started a garden oasis in your backyard. Next, I'm going to put my lettuces in. But for millions of others... I'm going to be posting stocks that will... They wanted to uproot the financial industry. Let's just lock it on up and take $15,000. Here's a stock that can change your life. I see a stock going up and I buy it and I just watch it until it stops going up and then I sell it. I have gained over $3 million. I want some free money. I don't think you can overstate the online communities and social media's influence on financial markets. A large group of inexperienced investors who discuss their plans on social media platform Reddit have shaken up the stock market in a big way. The stock that everybody's talking about right now is GameStop. Video game retailer GameStop is set to continue their head-spinning ascent today. The revolutionaries on Reddit are spanking Wall Street's ass. The more these stocks go up, the more the big guys are getting creamed and losing billions of dollars. This isn't a wealthy person's game anymore. Anyone can play it. I took up a little bit of a new hobby, and I am interested in day trading. As an investor nowadays, you don't have to look a specific way. You don't have to wear specific clothes. You don't have to be doing it from a trading floor or on Wall Street in like a high-rise building in, in, in downtown Manhattan. The narrative of what's driving the markets is no longer being held in secret offices in New York and Boston of privileged people talking to other privileged people. It's right out in the open. It's on Twitter. It's on Reddit. From brokerage apps to Discord channels and subreddits to TikTok influencers, one of the last holdouts in the world of disruption, finance, is next in line. Investing should be as ubiquitous as shopping online. That's Vlad Tenev, the CEO of Robinhood, the online brokerage app, talking about how he wants his app to disrupt the world of stock trading like Amazon disrupted the world of home shopping. And I think that speaks to exactly the mission that a platform like Robinhood has, which is to democratize investing. Robinhood was started in 2013 by Vlad Tenev and Baiju Bhatt in, where else, Silicon Valley, as an alternative to the big brokerages, but with one big difference. As they were building the social network around finances for people, they realized that there was a gap in the market and that free trading uh, could become something that they could uh, bring to the markets, they could disrupt the industry. While no fee trading is industry standard today, it was unheard of when it was first introduced. The online brokerage industry was really innovative when they came on the scene 10, 15 years ago, but they kind of stopped innovating where you haven't seen those commissions come down beyond five or six or seven dollars. Robinhood think that by offering zero commission that they're gonna push people onto this platform. And on top of no fee trading, the customers Robinhood was courting have been long overlooked in the world of finance. So the typical customer of a Charles Schwab, for example, is putting a lot more money in that brokerage account than the typical customer at Robinhood. Even today, with all of its popularity, the median account size is about $240. 
the Fidelities and the Schwabs and the E-Trades of the world, they look down their nose at those kind of accounts. I, I don't want a $1,000 account. They're just a headache. I want a $100,000 account. And this is key here, right? Because the thing about Robinhood that's different than every other single brokerage platform is how easy it is to use. The design of the Robinhood app really has in mind a user who might be coming at this absolutely cold. The fonts are very well sized, the shapes, the colors, all of that is something that the founders of Robinhood paid really close attention to. And by creating an interface that catered to a newer investor, they were able to gather a pretty healthy group of customers. And by 2019, they had about 10 million customers. Those 10 million customers were a huge success story for Robinhood, but no one could have predicted its explosion after the arrival of COVID-19. Remain indoors to the greatest extent and 100% of the non-essential workforce must stay home. What we saw when the pandemic hit was the growth of Robinhood users absolutely turbocharged. And oddly, you saw this surge in interest in stock trading. Then they saw the absolute surge in 2020 in customer growth. And now, by many accounts, they have more than 20 million customers, which is pretty extraordinary. So the next step for them is to figure out how to monetize those users and how, even with their small account sizes, to get them to grow with the company and, as it releases more products, come along with them. Robinhood would become one of the COVID economy's breakout successes. Robinhood traders, as they're called, became the shorthand explanation for the frenzy of often speculative retail investing after the pandemic lockdowns. Kids wake up in the morning, they go on Robinhood. They're, you know, in the shower, they check Robinhood. Kids are learning how the stock market works at 18 while they're at school, you know, checking their phones in between classes because notifications pop up telling them what their stocks are doing that day. With these new tools, millennials and Gen Z are investing in the market in ways their parents could have never even dreamt of. That is sort of key when we talk about the divide between older and younger generations is that the younger generation was exposed to so much more information and tools at their disposal to do what they want in the market. The older generations, you never had the technology or the cost structure that you could play the markets like you can today. So you were stuck with giving your money to a professional investor and paying them a fee to do it. When I speak to young kids, they tell me, I'm making mistakes, I'm losing money, I'm not a perfect investor, but I'm 18, and by the time I'm 30, which will be, you know, 10 years from now, I'm gonna have interacted with the markets for a decade, and so it's a learning experience more so than anything else. And you can look at it and you can say, wow, that's, you know, that's risk-taking, that's dumb, but, you know, if you could possibly shave 10, 20 years off your working life versus adding five years, I don't think you can fault people for that. But Robinhood is only part of the puzzle. Sure, you can trade on it, but without research, information, and data, you're just blindly throwing darts at different stocks and hoping to strike it rich. Wall Street forever has always run on what we now call narratives or memes. You know, people telling rumors to each other that have been around for 100 years. On Wall Street, information is its own currency. Historically, either you had it or you didn't and the people who had it had a huge advantage. In the past, those narratives and memes didn't have a network effect. It would be one person telling another person over the phone. In fact, when I broke into this business in the 80s, a lot of people used to complain 
that they weren't on the call list to get those ideas. Social media changed all of that. Fast forward to 2021, that's being done on the internet now. And that's being done on Discord and Twitter and StockTwits and Reddit. And the impact is very similar, but orders and orders of magnitude larger. As social media has played a bigger part in our lives, it's also played a bigger and kind of more important role in how people find investing ideas online and on these platforms. How do those ideas spread? On TikTok. Yes, that TikTok. Soon may the weatherman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. People aren't just going to it for sea shanty videos. The personal finance hashtag on TikTok has garnered 3.5 billion views from its 1 billion monthly active users. By comparison, videos found under the cooking and health tips hashtag have 2.6 and 2.1 billion views respectively. The trajectory of Robinhood and TikTok were literally on par. What happened in the stock market this week? So the word of the week is expectations. Absolutely essential that you guys understand the risks of shorting. And Kayla Kilbride and Kyla Scanlon are two of those financial influencer TikTokers, also known as Finfluencers. I think people still care about fashion, they care about culture, but it's also like there's this big behemoth thing called the stock market that we really don't know a whole lot about, and it's gatekept behind the industry. And so people like want to unpack that. And so my audience is um, a lot of them are younger investors who are looking to hone their skills. Tech and write up. Kyla and Kayla are two of the more, let's say, professional TikTok influencers. The Tesla Arc Bitcoin Biotech Risk Cluster. I've been trading since high school, and it was a really interesting way for me to fill out my decision-making frameworks and to think about thinking. And I think that the more that we can have people thinking about finance, the better that we're going to progress as a society. I think it's a huge gap in our educational system. If you're going to buy an option for a stock, you think it's going to go up, it's a call. So think of it like this. I made the options video where I was like, options are just like shopping. Rumor has it that this pal is about to go up in price. So if I come in tomorrow, can I still buy it at said price? And a ton of women just like attacked that video and were like, you explain things so much better than my boyfriend or my professor or like I could sit and listen to you all day. And I was like, the this is what I was looking for. <laughs> But TikTok's algorithm does not reward calm and measured videos about responsible investing. It rewards this. Watch this video for 30 seconds and you'll be rich for the rest of your life. I try not to say the A word, the ALGO word, <laughs> because TikTok listens to us. <laughs> The algorithm does impact how you feel. You know, you do notice which videos do better versus which videos do worse. How do you catch someone's attention in less than 60 seconds? And how do you make it something that they're like, I need this in my life? Nearly impossible to do that in 60 seconds. But the people who perfect it are the people that you're going to watch and going to stick around. And where people are sticking around? Reddit. And it's nearly countless subreddits about finance. And by far the biggest one of those is Wall Street Bets. There's a lot of social media platforms out there, but Reddit is like the social media platform for finance. Places like Wall Street Bets is where it all goes down. Started in January 2012, it wasn't long before Wall Street Bets adopted a 4chan-like etiquette, leading to their tagline, like 4chan found a Bloomberg terminal. We had all these unexplained stock moves, and we would be grasping for why stock XYZ jumped 20% in a day. And you would look at Wall Street bets, and you would see people there talking about buying options in that stock. And it, it sort of you know, squared the circle, so to speak, and, and started making sense. And it was at that point that it was like, wow, we have to start paying attention to this. Some people on the platform really spend tons of time, and others are just looking for entertainment and to have a little bit of fun, effectively gambling or looking for an outlet, trying to make a little bit of money. Then on top of all of that, there were stimulus checks. Now clearly this money is going to people who need to use that to eat, to live, but there's a lot of people who use this money to invest in the stock market. And it's not just stock tips. People quote unquote YOLO their entire life savings or stimulus checks on a single stock. They post what is called gain and loss porn, screen grabbing staggering hits and misses on stocks for the entire community to see. I'm about to lose everything. At 
while some of the people on Wall Street Bets are novice investors, the community contains multitudes. In one respect, what it did show us among these network groups is they are very sophisticated. They're not a bunch of ignorant people talking to other ignorant people. And this is where the pieces of the puzzle all come together to wreak havoc on Wall Street for a solid week in early 2021. It's pretty clear that the combination of more people having retail brokerage accounts and trading apps and more people being stuck at home looking for some kind of entertainment and some kind of community online came together in this very singular way. What came together is GameStop. Let's go back to the beginnings of what happened with GameStop a couple of years ago. On the boards like Reddit and StockTwist, a lot of people were talking about GameStop as being attractive value. Some of them are even, you know, Wall Street alums who, who left the industry and now still have access to tools that they can use to improve their financial well-being and make very good decisions. And I think Roaring Kitty is a perfect example of that. GameStop is one of the most compelling asymmetric opportunities in the market today. Really, I don't understand how you could disagree with that. At the same time that this crowd was talking it up, the hedge fund institutional crowd didn't like this stock at all, and it had the largest short interest of any stock in the New York Stock Exchange going into late 2020. Short selling is a bet that a stock price will fall, and it's a fairly simple concept. An investor borrows a stock and then sells it. The investor is betting on buying the stock back later for a lower price, before returning it to the original owner, pocketing the price difference. What a short seller would tell you is that they almost act as a policeman in the financial markets, or they're at least looking for companies that aren't what they say they are. And that can range anywhere from an outright fraud that some short sellers try to expose to just a company that's not worth as much as investors think it is. The problem is, if the stock price rises, the short seller has to come up with the money to buy the stock back. And the more it rises, the more it costs. And that's what's called a short squeeze. And the hedge fund Melvin Capital was on the wrong end of that squeeze. Melvin Capital lost over 50% of its money in the month of January alone, just from being caught in the short squeeze of the stock. This is where the disruption comes in. One of the most wild stories you're ever going to see. GameStop shares absolutely going nuts. In less than a year, the company's stock has jumped from less than $3 a share to almost $350. Cheers, everybody! <laughs> Roaring Kitty has turned $50,000 or so investment into some $14 million. Whoa! <laughs> Investors all over social media use the free trading app Robinhood to wreak havoc on Wall Street. They're actually piling on into some of these stocks to really hurt the professional short sellers. And they all used Reddit, Twitter, TikTok, and Discord to tell one another to keep buying and, quote, hold the line and not sell GameStop. People are getting cheerleaded for jumping in, buying at the highs. They're saying, keep going. And it was working, too, until... Thursday morning, the trading app Robinhood sent out this tweet. In light of current market volatility, we are restricting transactions, including GameStop. People were really angry. Robinhood was supposed to allow the regular people to play the same game these big boys are playing. But instead, we were all taken for schmucks and they screwed us. Shares of GameStop are jumping again now that retail investors are being allowed to buy shares of the stock. But what we learned is that when people organize online, they have the ability to disrupt the market. And it was a big sign the ivory walls of the institution aren't as powerful as maybe the institutions want them to be. I don't know if pumping up GameStop was the best use of billions of dollars, but I think that as a signal to society, it was pretty interesting and powerful. The GameStop saga was so impactful that both Vlad Tenev and Roaring Kitty were called in to testify before Congress to clarify each of their roles in the saga. One thing that's emerged from the congressional hearings is that they're interested in how retail brokerages make money and whether they're keeping the best interest of their customers in mind. But it's pretty fuzzy as far as what they would actually do as a result.
While the frenzy around GameStop eventually subsided, it didn't take long for retail investors to find other areas to invest their money. Take a look at Bitcoin going bananas over the weekend. Bitcoin forms a brand new all-time high. It was after GameStop started to drop that we saw Bitcoin really go up to over 60,000. How much further does this rally have to run? It's compelling to say that money shifted from one venue to the other. While correlation doesn't equal causation, there's a chart out there showing an inverse correlation on meme stocks going down and cryptocurrencies going up. There's definitely an aspect where people are making money on stocks and then moving, you know, they're agnostic, they're not hedge funds, they can invest wherever the hell they want. It's a classic sort of momentum trade. They're going to wherever the winners are and they're willing to jump on and, you know, ride it. So whether it's meme stocks like GameStop, meme coins like Dogecoin, or entirely new ways to invest in art like NFTs, the new kind of retail investor is making its presence known. Over the next 10, maybe 15 years, you're going to continue to see, whether by choice or by force, that baton go from older generations to younger generations. I don't think any single app uh, is, is going to be the thing that disrupts. I think people are the disruptors. How people get ideas about what to invest in has become increasingly entwined with social media. And as social media companies govern more and more of our lives, the fact that now they're tied in more intimately to people's wallets is something that we might want to understand better. Usually what disruption, I think, means is technology comes in, whether it's blogs to the newspapers or online retailing to brick and mortar. They come in and they're in the same business, but they just do it in such a gigantic cost savings that it causes everybody to switch. Well, that's the risk that happens here is that it's so much cheaper to just manage your own money. We're not there yet but costs and conveniences are moving in that direction. So I'd say, Wall Street, you haven't been disrupted yet, but you could be in the coming years, and that the final chapter on this story hasn't been written. Bloomberg's own David Nicholson. Now, his happy place is out in the field, on the open road. But like the rest of the world lately, he's been working from home a lot more than he's used to. COVID-19 has prompted a massive urban exodus as professionals of every ilk yearn for more space to live and work. As a result, rural areas have exploded and they're poised to experience a resurgence as more and more families pack up and leave the big city to try out life in the burbs. But there's one problem with that. Not all internet speeds are created equal. Anyone who might need to upload or download large files for a living may not want to pack up and move to that cabin in the woods just yet. Now, David's house isn't a cabin, but it is in the woods. And inexplicably, his internet is workable. My internet is okay. I pay a lot for it. It's around $140 a month. The download speed's great and the upload speed is terrible, uh, which is really bad for my work because I have to upload these massive files. But I'm definitely one of the more lucky ones in this community. Just a few miles down the road, my buddy has awful internet. It's usually under two down and under 0 0.2 up, so it's, it's often unusable. Some days it's around one, and other times it'll drop down to about point. 2.3. I just want to be able to have internet at my house without having to go outside the normal ways of acquiring internet. It's it's really frustrating. We're literally miles, a few miles away from downtown, and it just cuts off. 
this is a problem and the solutions are not there yet because getting high-speed internet in rural areas en masse is something our providers may simply not be ready for. If your internet service doesn't have fast download and upload speeds, then you don't have high-speed harmony. You have. Americans on average pay about $70 a month for internet at home. But in rural areas, it could cost a lot more for a lot less service. So the pricing uh, for a fixed wireless provider here can be something between $80 and $150 uh, for about 25 megabits per second. However, gigabit service, which is 1,000 megabits per second and symmetrical, is running at about $119 a month or $130 a month. That's John Paul. He co-owns Spiral Fiber, an internet service provider here in Nevada County, California. And for the past 10 years, he's been trying to bring an affordable fiber optic network to town. It all started when he applied to be part of the pilot program for Google's fiber service. Across the country, civic boosters have been going to extremes, chanting, singing, and marching, trying to get the search engine giant to look at their town. The internet these days is crucial to be in the world, to be a part of the world, and to be connected to your community. Google ultimately went with Kansas City, Missouri, which left Paul on a mission to get funding to lay out fiber optic networks for gigabit service. Over the next several years, he would attend conferences and pitch venture capitalists and apply for grants to make his vision come to life. One of the biggest roadblocks to building infrastructure for the internet here in the United States are the existing large providers. They have their land staked out, they would prefer that nobody come in and compete against them. In 2013, we applied for a grant. We went down and met with the commissioners at the California Public Utilities Commission. It was an arduous process to get funded, but we finally did against all odds. We got a $16 million grant, and then we went out to seek venture capital. Then, in March of 2020, the pandemic hit the world. Everybody got locked down, and everybody came home and everybody started using the internet. And I remember seeing on one of the local fixed wireless providers' websites, they've said, hey, we know you're all staying home, but please don't use too much video, and please don't use too much bandwidth. And I thought, that doesn't work. The US connectivity gap is far greater compared to countries that are considered its peers economically. Some developing nations actually have better internet than rural America, like in Kenya, which has a state-of-the-art fiber optic network fed in from their coastline. The American connectivity gap does largely affect rural areas that are either outside of service coverage or simply prohibitively expensive. This is Rebecca. She and her family moved to Nevada County just a couple miles down the road from David. They took for granted that high-speed internet would just exist in the area, and it's not something they even bothered to check on before buying their house. Turns out, all they got was dial-up. We wanted to move where we had a little more space, room for the kids to run around, you know, just be out in the mountains a little bit more. Having come from a bigger city area where Wi-Fi is pretty readily available, we hadn't really considered that in our purchasing of the house, whether that would be an option or not. When school started, and now that we are remote learning with our children and we're doing everything from home, we didn't have the option to do that at our house. So every day when school would start, we'd have to pack the kids up and we'd go to um, my in-laws home. They have a little cabin up in this area that does have Wi-Fi already. Rebecca's situation is the norm in rural America. According to data from the Federal Communications Commission, just 4% of urban Americans lack access to broadband internet. That's compared to almost 40% of people who live in rural areas. But while that was the case, there were also racial and socioeconomic divides in terms of who had that access. In addition to that geographic difference, low-income African-American students, Latino students, and first-generation college students were more likely than others to have only one device at home that's shared among multiple siblings and or lack access to that actual connection. For most American towns, there's also a lack of competition, forcing internet prices up. And large providers like AT&T and Comcast aren't incentivized to expand service to these rural communities. This is how Xfinity makes life simple, easy, awesome. So in our area, we have a small imprint of Comcast, but they're not going to go out to the more rural areas. It's just not cost-effective for them to do it as a large company. 
In order to lay fiber cable, you're actually physically digging trenches into the ground. And for internet service providers, they're primarily focused on maximizing their profits. And so the fewer customers you have, you know, in any square mile and the more fiber you have to lay, that's just kind of harder to pencil out from a purely economic standpoint. AT&T released a statement on the matter, expressing the need and desire for government assistance to fund fiber optic expansion to areas deemed unprofitable. Comcast released a similar statement encouraging more public-private collaboration on this effort. Federal agencies do offer grants to help communities build broadband networks, but many have argued that there's not enough flexibility on how to use these funds. The COVID-19 relief package passed by Congress in March and signed by President Donald Trump awarded $43.3 million to 51 projects on the East Coast alone. But it also stipulated that these projects needed to be up and running by December 30th. For contractors who plan projects months and years in advance, it's a scramble to rearrange their schedules to meet that deadline. So what we've been uh, asking the federal government to, to consider is at least have, as long as the projects are getting started, knowing the projects are being put into place to expand both remote learning, uh, working from home, and, and opportunities like that that are truly driven from COVID. We're moving as fast as we can regardless, but hopefully they'll give us some more time. Talking to John Paul, it's clear that he believes broadband is something that can transform a community and should be considered a public good. One of the first communities to come on in the United States with full-on gigabit service was Chattanooga, Tennessee. Now, they're a bigger city, but they're a city that was economically in a downturn. In the last 15 years, the city of Chattanooga has turned around in an amazing way. It's a nexus for young people to move to. It's a place where technology happens. It's not just about logging on to Zoom, you know, to, to connect with your colleagues who might be in New York City. It's also your ability as a small business, you know, operating in the town of Nevada City or wherever it may be to, you know, quickly upload your payroll documents or something onto the cloud or to quickly, you know, swipe a customer's credit card. There's just some really basic business functions and mechanics that I think people in big cities really take for granted and that are just going to be a much bigger challenge for small business owners in rural areas. Historically, the marginalized people, you call them as untouchables or Dalits, uh, they have been kept away from the center of the knowledge. Once you are born into a caste, it is very difficult for you to grow beyond that. You are stuck in that identity. I think education is the best uh, uh, way of liberating them. So that's how I chose to work in education sector. The kind of education that we are giving to the marginalized people is going to change not just the fate of these communities in Telangana, but it is going to be the source of inspiration, uh, you know, source of uh, hope for all the marginalized in this country. Greatest flight in India is the system of caste. For generations of Indians, the social code known as the caste system has defined how people earn a living and whom they marry. Although outlawed seven decades ago, castes remain a significant factor in deciding everything, from family ties and cultural traditions 
to educational and economic opportunities. Dalits, people who are on the lowest rung of the caste system, constitute almost one-fifth of India's population of 1.3 billion. Not able to afford the high tuition of private schools, many are forced to attend government-funded institutions, which in the past have suffered from poor infrastructure, lower education standards, and high student-to-teacher ratios. But Dr. Praveen Kumar is trying to change that. I am currently working as uh, you know, head of uh, Telangana Social Welfare Residential Schools. So totally above 400 schools I manage. These are all residential schools for the students who are historically marginalized but talented and then poor. Uh, of them, 60% are girls and then 40% are boys because uh, girls are more marginalized among the marginalized. Their voices are always uh, suppressed. My approach to improve the conditions in the schools uh, has been uh, put your eyes and ears on the ground always. Talk to the parents, talk to the teachers, talk to the students, uh, you know. Uh, stay in the schools and then understand their problems, their challenges, both in classrooms and then the corridors and the dorms. Then go to the dining halls and see what kind of food they are eating and then go to their homes and then what kind of food they are getting and what kind of uh, challenges the parents have. One of the important uh, changes uh, that I brought in after I took over was to complete the transformation of uh, mother tongue to English medium because English medium, uh, as, I, as I said, English is the language of emancipation a language uh, that connects you to the whole body of knowledge in the world. So we had to train a lot of teachers. Refer to the dictionary also, okay, and find out the new meanings. As Dana Sabha described about Hey, Richita, how are you? Hi, Sindhu. Fine, thank you. I'm, how about you? I'm fine, too. Identity is extremely important. No, it's, it, there, is, there is a scientific evidence to prove that, you know, your sense of identity is extremely uh, crucial to your growth as a successful human being in your life. If uh, you accept an identity which is very humiliating, which reminds you of very painful past, I think uh, that identity will not help you to grow. Not that I'm not saying that you should forget your past. I'm not saying that. But that should not be uh, in the bubble in which you must live always. <laughs> Sveros is an alternative identity. S stands for state. W stands for uh, welfare. Aero. Uh, SW and then Aero is Svero. So the idea is uh, your uh, dreams have to be skybound. So that is what uh, we are trying to achieve by changing the identities. Like, you know, we say, I'm a Svero and uh, I aim to be a doctor. I am a Swero, I aim to be a top-notch engineer. I am a Swero, I aim to be a top bureaucrat of this country. I am a Swero, I want to be a very good actor or you know, a musician in this uh, in the world. So these are the positive images that are associated with identity. Just to give an example to you, uh, see, uh, in 2012, in our institution, we used to produce about six doctors per year. But uh, because of our, uh, you know, this uh, self-liberating ideology of Sveroism, uh, we have, uh, this year, we have produced about 189 uh, doctors. This is phenomenal for any tourist of the poor people. You know how difficult it is to get into a medical colleges in this country. So, but today, uh, because of this ideology, the students have been able to achieve this, uh, you know, feat. Uh, Pujita is, uh, has been a farm laborer and her parents, the girls are agricultural laborers and then this girl used to sell vegetables but thanks to the residential education institutions, she came to the Gauli campus and then she uh, toiled very hard for one year uh, despite uh, you know, many problems. And uh, today I'm so happy to share with you that you know she, is, uh, she has joined uh, 
uh, one of the prestigious medical colleges in the state of Telangana, Usmani Medical College. And then in future, you know, she hopes to be a gynecologist. So this is the journey uh, our children are hoping for. Similarly, the Mount Everest expedition. Uh, Mount Everest expedition, we were uh, we, we are very fortunate enough uh, to place uh, the youngest ever female in the history of this world on the peak of Mount Everest. How did this happen? It's all because of an ideology that helps you to liberate yourself. We got a lot of extracurricular activities and most of them got institutionalized now. So for example, music. Similarly, the games. We have so many coaching academy, we have boxing academy, we have wrestling academy, we have uh, handball academy. So we have, uh, you know, kabaddi, that uh, the traditional Indian sport. We have golf. We have introduced the golf also. Like golf is generally played by so-called rich people, but today even poorest of the poor people also are being trained in uh, golf in our schools. Wow, so our intention has been to give all 360 degrees, uh, you know, type of opportunities to the students so that uh, you know whoever is interested in whatever activity they can go and then do it break the barriers break the fence at least mentally because the poor people have been programmed to be victims programmed to be subjugated programmed to be on the margins always programmed to feel inferior uh, we wanted to change on that. There are certain games which are exclusive to rich people. There are certain languages which are exclusive to middle class and upper middle class in this country. To put it in one word, the sole aim of uh, introducing all these co-curricular activities is to break the uh, stereotypes which are recklessly imposed on these people. Their stereotypes Dr. Kumar knows all too well. Born a Dalit, his grandparents were laborers and access to the village well was restricted. Dr. Kumar credits his parents' belief in the power of education with helping him realize his aspirations. He went on to join the Indian Police Service, attended Harvard University, and then began pursuing educational reforms back home. I attribute uh, whatever I am today it's to my mother primarily. They educated me in the village, although there were uh, no good schools. So then I stayed in uh, social welfare hostels, the hostels which are managed by government uh, for the poorest of the poor kids. I passed with uh, you know reasonably good grades. Then I went to university and then I faced uh, worst form of uh, discrimination in the universities. Like uh, there were you know uh, in those days I'm talking about. So the bathrooms and the you know toilets were exclusively meant for scheduled cars and scheduled tribe. We used to fight discrimination on one hand and then again you know uh, try to excel in academics. Uh, so that's how I came to education because I deeply believe that uh, education is the only important weapon uh, that can really, you know, place the poorest of the poor people from uh, from a very victimhood orbit to a prosperous orbit. I think uh, in future this is going to be a game changer for the marginalized in this country. Look at a thermal image of a city and then compare that to a map of vegetation you'll find that where there's greenery the temperature is lower that's because things like asphalt concrete and shingled roofs absorb more heat from the sun than trees this is the urban heat island effect a 
and it accounts for higher temperatures in cities, often by several degrees compared with their surroundings. It's becoming a huge risk to human health as growing urban populations exacerbate the heating effects of climate change. Heat waves kill more people than any other extreme weather event, more than tornadoes, hurricanes, and even floods. That's why urban heat island mitigation strategies are being studied in Singapore by a group of researchers. The government-backed project called Cooling Singapore is now in the process of combining everything they've learned to create a digital tool that can help cities all over the world, starting with Singapore. In Singapore, close to the equator, temperatures regularly rise above 32 degrees Celsius, or 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And the city structures only make it worse. And that is also the case for Singapore, which is basically a concrete jungle, more urbanized, more developed city. And even in Singapore, what you have is a situation whereby there's a temperature difference of 7 degrees Celsius between the more urbanized and the more rural areas. The government has taken drastic steps to keep temperatures down. This is Gardens by the Bay, an award-winning park, and inside this greenhouse is a pleasant 24 degrees. That's because the dome, along with two dozen nearby towers full of thousands of people, is chilled by what's probably the world's largest underground district cooling system. It uses a large central plant that cools water and then pipes it into banks, residential towers, an exhibition centre, shopping malls and the city's iconic Marina Bay Sands hotel and casino complex. So one of the biggest perks of using this system for the buildings is that they can save 40% in terms of electricity usage compared to your traditional air conditioners. And with Singapore relying on natural gas for most of its power, this new system means emission savings equivalent to removing 10,000 cars from the city's roads. That has big implications for the rest of the world. If things stay as they are, more than a third of the world's electricity could end up being used to cool buildings and vehicles by 2050. As the world gets hotter, gets warmer, there is a greater need for air conditioning and as well as refrigerators, for instance. And the more people are buying these household appliances, the more energy usage they, they, they use and uh, they release heat more and that then exacerbates climate change. It's a vicious circle. And so since 2017, researchers at Cooling Singapore have been identifying design solutions that reduce our need for so much cool air in the first place. One thing many cities have in common, and that's the importance of vegetation. That's a very important measure to mitigate the urban heat because of the shading effect, of course, and the psychological effects of the vegetation, and also because of the possible evaporative cooling effect of the vegetation. Vegetation can be, of course, on the ground floor in form of trees and shrubs, and you can walk under them. This is the so-called canopy layer that the vegetation forms above us. But vegetation can also go up the facades of buildings, and it can go to the roof of the buildings. Luckily, Singapore has been striving for the garden city feel for quite some time. It was a vision initially introduced by then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew in 1967 to make life more pleasant for people. And today, Singapore is one of the world's greenest cities in terms of urban vegetation. Kampung Admiralty, a community centre that contains health facilities and social spaces, now provides more green space than the plot of land it was originally built on. It's topped by a roofscape of staggered terraces covered in local plants, which functions as a community park and a village green in the centre that contains farm plots for residents to tend to. Park Royal on Pickering was designed as a hotel in a garden that doubled the green growing potential of its site. There's now 15,000 metres of sky gardens, reflecting pools, waterfalls, planter terraces and green walls. And the government has big plans as well. 
Singapore actually has a plan to plant 1 million trees and add more green spaces over the next 10 years. It is actually a mix of one thing to reduce the urban heat island effect, but on the other hand, is also to get the people to be more connected to nature. But it's not enough. The city-state has still been warming twice as quickly as the world average over the past six decades. That's why Cooling Singapore has developed a catalogue of other potential heat mitigation measures. When you try to mitigate your heat island effect in a city or in any building, in a village as well, the first place to start is by shading of the windows. You have to keep areas clear so that the wind can move through it. Uh, water of a certain depth can act as a very good thermal buffer. If you have to construct heavy buildings such as high rises, at least you can make the surface, the facade, less heavy and you can protect it from direct sun penetration. You have to make sure that no combustion engines will be in the city in the middle, in the medium to long term range. So ideally the electricity production is outside of the city and you bring just the clean electricity into the city. You can at least minimize the use of energy in the city and you can start to slowly convert the roofs, the facades of the city into production areas for renewable energy. In Singapore, unfortunately, this is a limited option, but in the long run, it could produce up to 20, 25% of the energy of the electricity needed in Singapore if all the roofs and the areas in the buildings, on the buildings, on the facades would be used to do that. With so many different ideas, Cooling Singapore is also designing a virtual model of the city to test them out. It's called a Digital Urban Climate Twin, or DUCT, that will calculate how each element of the city's design will impact the urban heat island effect. That means we model not only the geometry of the buildings digitally, but also we model the transportation, the insulation, the temperature, the radiation coming from the sun, the weather, the local weather, the local climate, the even very, very microclimate of the city, the water, the movement of people in the city. We can invent scenarios, we can design scenarios, test them before we actually build them, and if they test very well, and we are sure that they will function, then we can start to build them and put them into reality. Singapore will be using this new tool to figure out which actions it should take next. And the model can be applied to any city, whether it needs to keep heat out or keep heat in, which will ultimately save energy, slow climate change and improve our quality of life. So this is something that Singapore will be able to export, maybe even together with its city development systems that it already has. Singapore is one of the very few cities in the world that really combine this scientific approach with a very well-established urban redesign and urban design approach. Through its agencies and the combination of its agencies, it has achieved a lot um, in the past. If it keeps following the scientific path and the combination with the other knowledge in the city already, we think that it will be a very comfortable and very livable uh, city in the future, even more than today.
Times are tough. Jobs are scarce. It's risky to be outside and around others. Seems like there's very few ways to make extra money during a pandemic. So I guess I'll just hunker down and binge social media until this all blows over. <sighs> Wait, don't these people make money? How do these people make money? Streamers, YouTubers, Twitch stars, how do they make money? Is it a lot? Is it a lot of work? I know, I gotta ask somebody in the biz, and I got just the guy, Austin John Plays. Is, this is your full-time job now, right? As of November of last year, yes. This was always just kind of like a side thing. Like, any money that I made from doing my videos and whatever else, I never touched that, because I didn't really think of that as being like real money. And then it started coming in more and more. And then it was like, I hit my first day that I broke a grand. And I was like, this is actually gonna be money. How did the YouTube channel come to be? When the game Pokemon Sun and Moon came out for the 3DS, there was like things that I learned about the game. And then I, I wanted to just share that information with people. And at the time, I didn't have any way to capture a screen or anything, so I found, like, generic footage, and I kind of put it all together with so much editing. And that video got six views. And then two days later, I made another one, and that one got 12 views. And then I just started pumping out more and more content, and people were like, this guy knows what he's talking about. And it really just started building on top of itself, and then it was like, Phew. my channel really focuses on tips and tricks, so I play a straight 18 hours and I'll finish the game or get to about the 40 hour mark and then I'll make my first video. While I'm going through, I have a giant notepad and just scribbles everywhere and I make these notes of like the things that stumped me so I know the things that may stump other people. Uh, what do you need to think about if you're building your YouTube channel? One, you need to do something that you're passionate about. Not that you like, not that you think you're gonna make money on, something you're passionate about. This other thing is something that other people are passionate about. It holds a special place to them. And third is, it needs to be something that people are gonna seek out information on. In order to enter into the marketplace, you either need to be better than everyone else, you either need to be faster than everyone else, or you need to be more accessible than everyone else. And you can't be more accessible because it's already on the platform. Granted, if you understand how the algorithm works, which is very similar to Google Analytics, then yeah, you can have a little bit of a head start. But if you're not doing it faster, and if you're not doing it better than everyone else, then why should anyone watch your channel? So my income as a YouTuber kind of breaks down to three different ways. One, which is the bulk of it, which is ad revenue. Whenever you go and you watch a video and then there's an ad and then you wait five seconds and you hit the bottom right corner and then you go on to the next video or a non-skippable ad or the video starts immediately, you get the little banner ad at the bottom or uh, if you scroll down from the video, the first thing that shows there is an ad. Those are the four different types of ads that can appear on every single YouTube video. And all of them pay a certain amount. It varies on lots of things like the country, of the person who posts it, the country of the person who watches it, uh, the time of year, where you are in the quarter, if there's anything going on with uh, a reduction in ad revenue. Like, great example, COVID-19, companies weren't as spending as much on advertising. So because of that, CPM went down. Uh, CPM stands for a click per thousand. I'm using the Roman numeral for thousand. And that means that for every 1,000 views, you get a certain amount of money. Now, on low ads, when I first started off, my CPM was 30 cents. So every 1,000 views, I made 30 cents. But then once I signed with an MCN and I started making more quality content and more engaging content, some of my better videos and certain times of the year, I can see CPMs as high as 12 to $14. And there's a big fluctuation between, you know, if I post a video when there's no ads being spent like January and February, that's a reason a lot of your favorite YouTubers and also TV shows don't post new videos uh, in that time of year because ad rates are down. Why are they going to make content then? Instead, you're recording and you're bulking up for when ad revenue is higher. 
The second way that a YouTuber makes uh, income is support, crowdfunding, things like that. When I first started off, Patreon was really the only option, but then they started rolling out supporters and members for YouTube channels. So whenever I have a live stream, you can click a button and then you can become a member and then you get uh, special icons next to your name. I believe they're called badges or on any video, you can hit the join button and that helps support the channel. And then the third aspect of that would be merch. And for me, my merch has been somewhat basic. In fact, I'm wearing one of my t-shirts from last year right now. You have to endure the times that your first video gets six views, that you post it on Reddit and they say, shut up, and then an auto mod bans you. You have to go through that because until you go through that and you discover why you're doing it, you're not doing it for other people. You're doing it for yourself. If you're not loving what you do, then it's not worth it. Huh. So make a channel about something that I'm passionate about. Oh, sweet. I guess I can make the channel about that. Now, how do I grow an audience? How do I get popular? It's all about diversification, right? You have to have a massive Twitter following. You have to have a massive Instagram following. You have to have a massive YouTube following. Of course, you have to be on Twitch, which is the key platform, but basically any way you can get in front of your audience, you can engage with your audience, um, is going to drive those clicks, which ultimately drives the advertiser revenue that you get back from all of these platforms. It's me and Dan playing video games and talking in a funny manner over them. They're not just people who are good at games. They're actually people who are good at online engagement, online entertainment, first and foremost. You have the right to remain stylish. Anything you wear can and will be used against you in the court of fashion. The streamer is either very, very talented at the game the best player in the game is generally going to draw a crowd because people like watching people who are very good. On the other hand, they're either very, very good or funny, charismatic, whatever it is on that side. Oh, no. You know, it becomes more of a show where they talk about other things outside of the gaming world and gaming becomes really just a back dropping an excuse to engage with that audience. There, there were those weird, like, Ronald McDonald, like, straight-to-VHS movies. You remember those? I'm personable, I'm chatty. I would kind of, you know, when boring things were happening in the game, I would ramble on about, you know, movies I'd watched or books I'd read and, you know, or conversations I'd had and stuff like that. And so I think being personable was a big part of that. It's not just getting on and playing games. It's getting on and being an entertainer. You are putting on a show. All right, now let me go ahead and grab the samurai sword that every gym has. Okay, he's dead. To have a larger audience and, and to have that audience, I think, stay with you, you have to bring something extra. You, know? you have to find your niche. You have to find what works and what connects with the audience and, and what makes them laugh and what makes them keep coming back. Then you got to make it a little more exciting. All right, throw in a hanging bishop. Have everybody in suspense for a moment. I think the real most important thing is, is to just get used to being on camera, like in any sort of performance thing, is get used to talking on camera. Um, you know, I was, my first few videos were terrible, but because I sat down and did it for six to eight hours a day, I just got used to talking and I got over that uncomfortable hump. If you go into Twitch purely with the expectation that you're going to make money, make a job out of it, have all this growth and it's going to be great, you're probably going to burn out prior to getting to that point because there's very little payoff for a long time, right? Like multiple years generally before you really start to see a payoff. And so, you know, those first few times you're streaming, nobody is there. One person shows up every 30 minutes, says hi, maybe, and leaves, right? Like, it's very uh, discouraging, I think, for a lot of people. And so you have to be there just loving it. You have to love talking to yourself when nobody is around. You have to love just the game that you're playing, all of that stuff, because it takes 
a while, and I think a majority of people burn out prior to getting to the, like, profitable point of it. And there you have it. My very own YouTube, Twitch, Discord, and streaming channels all ready to go live. It's a veritable social media ecosystem just on the verge of thriving. So don't forget to smash like and subscribe and visit my Patreon for perks. Also, go to my merch page. And one last thing, stay cool, my friends. live stream shopping, one of the hottest trends in China. Every night, tens of millions of people watch live shows hosted by influencers like Bia and buy the products they recommend. Or on e-commerce and social apps like Taobao and Douyin, the sister app of TikTok. Not about you know only shopping. It's about the experience. It's about having fun. You got to see three D. You got to see in some kind of action. It's almost like a theater act. The internet craze has taken over China. By the end of 2020, the country had almost 400 million live stream shopping users. China's live stream e-commerce market has also grown dramatically. With an estimated value of 161 billion dollars in 2020, it's becoming popular outside China as well. So, is live streaming the future of shopping? Live streaming is not a new thing. In China, it started in 2015 with the rollout of 4G, and it was first used for entertainment and socializing. Many live streamers perform for their followers or chatted to them, making money by receiving virtual currency and gifts. In the West, live streaming is mainly the domain of avid gamers. In China, it's broken into e-commerce. China actually has a very big e-commerce empire, so it uses these super apps, what we call、um, that. You have payment, you have search of information, you have recommendation system, and you have huge amount of goods available on the platform, and as well as a lot of consumers. So with this advantage, they merge、um, these features of live streaming、uh, to make the influencers actually sell goods. Here is a perfect choice: nice neutrals, beautiful print, nothing overwhelming, and the. Warmth and comfort of flannel. This is item. Traditional TV shopping involves a one-way direction, whereby a host introduces a product, demonstrates certain things, and say, "Call this number" or something. But live stream shopping is live. That in itself is a very, very big difference. It causes different psychology, and live stream shopping is a, a very entertaining way of actually engaging someone else. When you shop, actually, the、uh, live streaming video will continue. It will minimize into a corner, and you can like buy the items and pay all on the same app. And after that, the live streaming screen will just enlarge by itself, and the、uh, promoter will come back to screen. So it's like very convenient. Taobao, one of China's biggest e-commerce platforms owned by tech giant Alibaba, added a live streaming function in early 2016. In the following years, other e-commerce and social platforms like JD and Douyin also integrated this feature. 开头的时候还是有很多的挑战的，对画面的这个流畅，然后是否能够很真实的去还原商品，它其实在这个上面是有很高的这个门槛跟技术的这个卡口在的。
管是我们的这个用户的接受度，还是商家的这个上手的这个难度都很高。但是这几年下来，基本上难点在不断被突破的。Over 70 billion dollars worth of goods was sold via live stream on Taobao in the year through March 2021. Latest surveys show that over 60 percent of live stream users in China were watching shopping shows, and over 65 percent of them shopped at least once via live stream. In 2020, live stream shopping got a huge boost during the pandemic. When millions of people were in lockdown and many retailers were pushed online, people, you know, during the lockdown, felt like there's a need for more social uh, interactions. This live platform creates an interesting kind of uh, environment that these people the sense that I'm actually interacting with you. And then live stream shopping brings in a lot more variety of things that people could buy and satisfy, you know, their sense of, the sense of like losing control, especially during the pandemic. At the heart of this craze are the top influencers who have tens of millions of followers and sell products worth millions of dollars every night. They often use their star power to get bargains from retailers, which in turn boosts their own sales and influence. So if you think about um, China's live streaming, you have to know the king and queen of the influencers. The queen of live streaming, Via, she is actually having the biggest viewership and uh, the biggest sales volume for a long time on Taobao platform. She can sell everything from like Gucci sunglasses, um, lipsticks, homes and cars. One time she offered her followers to go on a Tesla ride with her and she even, for once, sold a rocket launch in her live streaming room for 40 million yuan. The king would be Li Jiaqi, more widely known as Lipstick's brother. He used to be a cosmetic sales um, before he turned into live streaming e-commerce. And uh, he knows a lot about the cosmetics. So he's the one that will actually put the lipsticks on himself when uh, he's on the show. Top live streamers like Via and Li Jiaqi have become celebrities in China and can earn millions of dollars a year. Although not everyone can be as popular, mid-ranking live streamers like Tiffany still earn a good income through sales commissions. If we talk about the salary, the salary is higher than a regular job. But the salary for the job is higher than a regular job. So the salary for the job is higher than a regular job. 就是每天需要呃集中精力，然后长达五六个小时，这种状态是很累的。而且这五六个小时的话，你是脑子是不停的，然后眼嘴巴是不停的，然后手也是不停的，眼睛也是不停的。像我们做主播，不是说单一的只做直播一件事情，然后还会有呃选品的一些工作，然后还会有一些其他的事情排在里面，其实是没有个人生活的。那我觉得增强粉丝影响力的话，不是说某一件事情。啊，可能今天做了什么事情，你就增大了影响力，而是每天不断不断的内容的输出，粉丝不断的可能对你的了解，慢慢的信任你。没有芝麻的芝麻酱的味道，如果吃不习惯的话就慎买。A lot of successful live streamers are generally very good at communication. They're very good at at articulating very simply what a product does, what a product doesn't do. In order for them to sell, they need to be trustworthy. And appear trustworthy, and they need to, you know, show in some ways that they're authentic, right? So for Via and Lichasi, they are able to articulate that quite a bit through their body language, through what they say. For example, uh, Lichasi will always, you know, sometimes say things bad, bad things about certain products because to him, that's his honest opinion, and sometimes people want to hear that. And so they seem very credible, they seem very trustworthy, and uh, don't forget, they're also very entertaining and very interesting. If you're familiar with Li Chiaxi, he won a, a Guinness record for like the most lipstick applications to models in like, 30 seconds. So if you're able to create a lot of buzz with really interesting things that you do, people who may not want to buy lipsticks will also stream in just to watch what he does. And then from there, you, you might get hooked. Live streamers also use sales techniques such as limited time or supply. This sense of scarcity can often encourage viewers to buy. The platform in itself creates and enhances some of these things, but you see it live. Something we call social proof has taken over, meaning that, hey, other people are interested, other people are joining in, other people want the same product. 
and they add it in the chat and they ask questions and they say, oh, I want this too. What happens then? It makes the whole product even more scarce. But it's not just influencers. Local farmers, luxury brands, even mutual funds have also started their own live stream shows. Working with very top tier live streamers can be risky. It's not necessary that the benefits will end up with the brand. So we see company executives opening their own shows, um, and we see like PNG have their own sales room which runs shows every day as well. Uh, we also have like local governors in like small towns to sell their agricultural products. So the live streaming is definitely transformed the way product owners can think about how to reach their consumers and it enables a lot of players to actually sell. Live stream shopping is going global. Merchants in Southeast Asia have embraced this trend. And in the West, Amazon has upgraded its live streaming function, adding interactive features like chat rooms. Companies, including Google and Facebook, are also developing and investing in technologies to integrate video and e commerce. 直播电商它其实已经开始成为主流，它未来的发展空间跟潜力都是巨大的。接下来大家会越来越依赖这种购物方式，会变成一个比较日常化、比较规范化的这么一个趋势。If you look at the numbers alone, their numbers alone, Li Jiaxi's numbers or Via's numbers, you know that they can sell, and you know that you know they can generate revenue. Are they able to sustain it over a long period of time? Uh, it depends on how innovative they are at changing some of the things that they do. But you can't expect consumers one day turn into virtual shopping for good. There will be the nature of us that crave to go into the store to touch the goods and actually wear it and see how it looks like and walk around in that with our friends. And those things wouldn't be replaceable with live streaming. Imagine that the oceans are actually the largest battery. We're storing huge amounts of energy in the oceans. The wave motion can be very deep. It can extend down several hundred meters. And once it gets to the near shore, from about 50 meters, the whole water column is moving backwards and forwards. As we search for ways to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels, some are looking to a largely untapped potential source of renewable energy. In theory, waves off the coast of the United States alone could generate over 2 trillion kilowatt hours of electricity a year, enough to power more than half of the country. Waves intensify and subside not as quickly as the wind, and that means that it can produce a smoother power generation curve. One of the potential advantages of wave energy is that um, it could act as a complementary source of power um, compared to other renewables on the grid if it were to be scaled up to commercial scale. For decades, engineers have been trying to convert wave energy into electricity, but a host of technological and financial challenges have complicated their efforts. In the years from around 2006 to 2015, there were um, a spate of bankruptcies in the sector, and this was largely because of a lack of kind of continuous proven projects out at sea with reliable electricity generation. Since then, companies have been trying to develop the technologies at a steadier pace and with a smaller cash burn. But the same questions remain. Can companies develop devices and technologies that actually work? Is wave energy just a novelty or something that can become a major renewable energy source?
BC is a very challenging environment within which to operate a power project. So seawater is corrosive and conditions are very rough. So this means that power projects don't have a very long lifetime and it increases operating and maintenance costs. Partly because of that, many early wave energy projects hit rough waters, such as the Palamis Wave Energy Converter in Portugal and the Isla Limpet project in Scotland. But that hasn't stopped others from trying. Companies are focused on testing projects out at sea, proving their durability, um, trying to raise capital and bring down cost. The sector hasn't really um, converged around one single technology design and companies are kind of undecided about which design works best. Finland-based AW Energy is a veteran in the sector. The first proof of concept of the company's device was made in the 90s after diver Rauno Koivosari observed the strong back and forth movement of a hatch cover in a shipwreck in the Baltic Sea. The waves are generated far from the coastline, so the wind blows on the, on the surface of the water, causing the water particles to rotate, and that rotation extends deep down below the surface and, and the waves can be very long they can be several hundred meters long and as they come into the near shore this rotational energy turns into an elliptical energy and eventually backwards and forwards as you probably noticed if you've been swimming on the seashore in large waves you're pulled in and out that's the energy that we're extracting but there's a sweet spot where we deploy so around 10 to 15 meters of water depth that's where there's still strong wave energy coming in. After years of research, prototyping and testing, the company has deployed Wave Roller, a 350 kilowatt device in the waters of Portugal. Wave Roller has an 18 meter wide and 10 meter high steel panel fixed to the seabed via a floatable foundation. The panel moves back and forth with the waves, capturing the energy. It's submerged in the depth of 15 meters, so it's, it's protected from the extreme waves. We generate electricity by capturing the movement with hydraulic circuitry in a machine room underneath the surface. That hydraulic energy we turn to electricity with hydraulic accumulators and hydraulic motors and also a generator. The wave roller has survived large waves at sea for over a year and delivered electricity via an underwater cable to the grid in Portugal. Meanwhile, the company has won a 2.5 million euro grant to work on an upgraded version of the wave roller, aiming to increase the electricity generation capacity to one megawatt. The upscale device would have a bigger panel, two power takeoff units and improved software to control the energy production. We have uh, taken into use a wave prediction algorithm that kind of tells us what kind of waves are coming in to our device. That gives us a few seconds to prepare uh, for capturing more energy, and the difference in that is significant. Our future plans are to deliver technology ar around the world. So I'm hoping... Connection lost working on, on delivering technology to projects in Asia and, and also in, in the American continent as well. Meanwhile, Israeli company EcoWave Power is taking a different approach to capturing the power of the ocean. For the company's founder, Inna Braverman, developing new sources of renewable energy is a personal mission. I was born in Ukraine in 1996 and two weeks after I was born, the Chernobyl nuclear reactor exploded, causing the largest in history nuclear disaster. I was one of the babies that got hurt from the negative effects of such explosion. I had a respiratory arrest and a clinical death. Luckily, my mother and nurse approached my crib on time and gave me a mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, which saved my life. I got a second chance in life and decided to do something good with it. Growing up, Inna wanted to be a politician to positively change the world. After working as a translator at a renewable energy company, she decided to change paths. 
solar and wind energy were fully commercialized. There were a lot of amazing technologies implemented everywhere. I saw that wave energy, although it's an immense source of electricity, the biggest companies in the world are trying to develop wave energy with no success. And there was kind of a race going on in the world of who is the company that is going to develop a viable wave energy solution first. In 2011, the then 24-year-old Inna co-founded EcoWave Power. Instead of installing devices offshore, the company's devices are attached to existing breakwaters, jetties, and piers. Our technology is very cost efficient, especially in comparison to the offshore technologies, because we don't need any ships, divers, underwater mooring or cables. We install on existent man-made structures and all our expensive equipment, the generator, the hydraulic conversion unit, the automation, is located on land just like a regular power station. This is the EcoWave Power conversion unit that has been operating in Jaffa port since 2014 until 2020. Here you can see how the technology works. Basically, the floaters are going up and down and pushing the hydro cylinders, which transmit biodegradable fluid into land-located accumulators. A pressure is being built, the higher the waves, the higher the pressure, which is used to turn the hydro motor, which is turning the generators. The whole system is controlled by a smart automation system, which you can see right here. And in case of upcoming storms, the system automatically raises the floater above the water level and keeps them in the upward position until the storm passes. The company has been operating a 100 kilowatt grid connected device in Gibraltar since 2016, which is enough to power 100 households. Currently, Inna and her team are working on another 100 kilowatt project at the Port of Jaffa in Tel Aviv. The project will be also the first time in the history of Israel that wave energy will officially connect to the electrical grid. And our goal going forward is to expand it to all suitable breakwaters in the city of Tel Aviv and to supply a significant part of the city's electricity needs. Today, engineers and entrepreneurs are still trying to crack wave energy. Globally, only a few hundred kilowatts of wave energy are deployed, compared with gigawatts of offshore wind. But the field has come a long way in recent years, and with the right engineering solutions, this new power source could eventually become competitive with more mature renewables like solar and wind. I would have a lot more confidence in the success of wave energy companies today as opposed to like 20 years ago. But in the next um, few years or maybe the next couple of decades, it, it will be more likely to be used in remote locations um, like islands that are otherwise dependent on expensive diesel power or out at sea on gas decommissioning rigs or for powering um, underwater autonomous vehicles. So definitely, wave energy can compete with other renewable energy sources, but I personally believe that this is not a competition. In order to have a 100% renewable energy friendly world, we need all renewable energy sources to work together.
して変化を与えてあなたの名前を呼んで私の名前を言ってあなたは何でも変化をしてくれなかったから書き入れたんです。So can you please tell me? どうもありがとうございます。I'm not gonna... Please wait. You know, I've covered a lot of companies. I've covered a lot of、uh, Machiavellian companies where you know, people play rough. I don't think I've ever seen anything on the scale of Nissan. He's making you, but you're a real one from this one. I mean, it's corrupt. One of the most dramatic elements was、uh, Ravinder Pasi's home、uh, being raided by、uh, court officials in Yokohama. You scared me, right? So, Rav Pasi's journey into the, the darkest recesses of the Japanese corporate world started when he was the general counsel, the highest corporate lawyer position in the, the company. In the past few minutes, Nissan has revealed that its chairman has been arrested after allegations of serious misconduct. He was tasked with investigating Carlos g a u And he, he was told, conduct an internal investigation and get to the heart of the matter. And then along the way, he started to notice serious conflicts of interest. He is one of the few people who knows、uh, an extreme amount of detail regarding the alleged crime by Carlos g o n And、uh, he's now ready to tell his own story. On the record about some of the events that happened. Um, my name is Ravinder Passi. I'm the former global general counsel of Nissan Motor Co. Limited.、Um, and you could say, yes, I had a front row seat in terms of what was going on. When Carlos g o n saved Nissan years ago, he was depicted in Japanese comic books as this hero, and, and now maybe we'll see comic books where he's the villain. In corporate Japan,、uh, Nissan was quite an unusual company. It was、uh, led for two decades by、uh, a non Japanese executive. Well, Carlos g o n was a hero in the Japanese business world. If you had a global business celebrity, In Japan、uh, and worldwide, it was definitely Carlos g o n In a country with few foreigners at the top, he stood out. But over the years, he saved Nissan from bankruptcy, allied with Renault and Mitsubishi, and turned the alliance into one of the most competitive in the world. Yet, as the years went on, you know, he, I think his ambitions changed a little bit. He started thinking about legacy plays, and one of them was to really tighten the alliance between Renault and Japan.、Uh, and unbeknownst to him,、uh, there was、uh, a contingent of senior Nissan executives that were really、uh, uh, felt threatened by that move. They really thought that they would lose complete control of the. The, the, the car company, and even in the government, there was probably a little bit of anxiety about a national champion、uh, in the auto industry falling under full blown foreign control. Carlos g o n was an auto industry leader, respected by many in Japan. Now he's in jail. The arrest of Carlos g o n came completely out of the blue.、Uh, this was in November of 2018. He was coming to Japan on Nissan's corporate jet for a regular、uh, executive meeting, and he was met on the tarmac by Japanese authorities who、uh, whisked him away to、uh, jail and charged him with financial misconduct crimes. So, what happened was that a power struggle ensued inside the company, and somewhere along the way, it was criminalized. Uh, by that, I mean that、uh, there were、um, allegations leveled at Carlos g o n about、uh, the way he reported his pay to Japanese authorities, the way he handled money inside the company, that in other contexts might have been a board action, might have been held, handled internally. A number of executives at Nissan decided to take this, this difference and take it over to the Tokyo prosecutor's office, and that unleashed. A chain of events that would shake the entire auto industry. So, after Carlos g o n was arrested, Nissan launched an internal investigation 
into the events that led up to his arrest. So Rob Posse was tasked with investigating Carlos Ghosn. And he, he was told, get to the heart of the matter. Find out what Carlos Ghosn did wrong and bring it to our shareholders. It, yeah, it's really complicated because you had various things coming out of the weeds. 2018 the investigation has, has started and we become aware of matters in terms of conflicts, actions by certain individuals um, that cause some concern because things might not quite be what they seem. So in our story, we really took a close look at Hari Nada and his role in Carlos Ghosn's downfall. Hari Nada is one of the most fascinating figures inside uh, Nissan. He's also a, a lawyer. Uh, he's originally Malaysian. Hello, Mr. Hari. Uh, and he had a meteoric uh, rise through the company and became very, very close to Carlos Ghosn and other top figures. He had a front row seat at all the major strategic deliberations at the, at the company. And when he discovered that Carlos Ghosn, uh, as his final legacy play, was going to tighten the relationship between Renault and Nissan, he made a decision to go against Carlos Ghosn. And he became uh, one of the key figures uh, that decided that Carlos Ghosn had to go. Harry Nada was somebody who actually recruited me into the company, so I have a long-standing uh, relationship with him, or did have a long-standing relationship with him. Um, for, for many, many years, he was a mentor. I had doubts about the credibility of the, pro of the process right at the start. Harry Nada had a plea deal with the Tokyo prosecutors. Now, that suggests he was intrinsically involved in some of the wrongdoing or the allegations of wrongdoing. And it just didn't smell right, just doesn't sit right. So there was a basic conflict of interest. In other words, Hari Nada uh, had to deliver results to Japanese prosecutors to avoid his own criminal liability. And he's accusing and leading the investigation of Carlos Ghosn some of the people who had been involved in the original alleged crimes were also uh, looking into the affairs themselves. Ravinder Pasi began pointing out uh, some of these conflict of interest issues. And the reason for that is uh, essentially uh, his concern was for the company. If the company's own investigation into itself was compromised, uh, that could lead to a very weak position uh, in various lawsuits that it was uh, dealing with across the world. I had discussions with Harry, um, discussions about with the statutory auditors about these conflicts, discussions with HR about some of these conflicts, because at that point, we reported into him. You know, at the time, it, everything was quite, um, as you can imagine, it was, we've got to do this, we've got to do that, we've got to move fast. But when you step back and look at some of these things, you just think, my God, what was going on here? Because me, members of my team, were being placed in immediate danger. Your, your chairman's been arrested. A representative director's been arrested. They both happen to be foreigners. And then now what we need to do, we're being instructed to do, is certain compliance professionals need to go into properties in Brazil, for example, and retrieve evidence. They've got to do it very carefully, because if they don't do it carefully, they're going to get convicted of criminal activities. And likewise, when a team of lawyers were commissioned to go to Lebanon, I mean, one of my immediate concerns was, why are lawyers from Nissan being sent to go to Lebanon to retrieve evidence. These are just lawyers, they're corporate lawyers from Nissan. You had revelations that a number of executives had benefited from share appreciation rights when they shouldn't have. I mean, you know, 
substantive amounts of money being taken by these guys when they weren't entitled to take it. And you do think, yes, how is this going to look later on? It's going to look quite concerning. Um, so that triggered for me the sort of assessment that, well, I'm going to have to do something because up until this point, I haven't put down on paper these conflicts and these issues. Posse makes a fateful move. He writes this letter to the board listing every uh, suspicion he has in great detail, backed up by evidence, backed up by memos, of why this internal investigation had serious problems. He sends the letter to the board, and it's crickets. He doesn't hear much of anything. Nothing happened thereafter. Nothing at all. Just like it just gone into a black box. And uh, he began to suspect that... Uh, there was a desire, even at the highest level within Nissan, to uh, kind of sweep these conflicts of interest under the rug. Unfortunately for me, I think, you know, again, with hindsight, people must have thought that this is the nail that's sticking out, and we can't have this. Within three days of me submitting that to the board of directors, that letter to the independent board of directors, I was removed from the go and executive conduct matters. I was then told that I could not attend board meetings anymore. And up until that point, I had attended every single board meeting. I was then also told that after eight years of being in Japan, I'd be going back to the UK. It eventually transpired that I'd be the VP of projects and transformation, managing a team of three. So you can imagine what this feels like at this stage. Um, almost an arbitrary removal from Japan, where I've lived for eight years, had three children there, my family has grown up, and we've been settled there. Having, a few months earlier, been promoted to vice president at a global level, to being um, almost demoted. So Pasi was essentially being uh, reassigned to uh, get him as far away from uh, the internal investigation as possible, and also to a certain extent um, in retaliation to some of the uh, issues that he brought up regarding uh, the internal investigation and Harinada. What happened to Rav Pasi can be seen as a series of, of corporate humiliations. I mean, first of all, his immediate responsibilities were taken away from him. Eventually, he'd lost you know, the coveted general counsel title. But it didn't stop there. Toward the end of his stay in Japan, uh, Rob and his wife were convinced that they were being followed. During that period, I'd noticed that whilst driving my car, I'd have other cars following me. First time I noticed this was around mid-March, and I was driving can't remember where I was going, but this grey van, small van, just literally started following me. And I noticed that there was somebody in the car taking pictures. And lo and behold, we were absolutely being followed um, by either by people on foot or other individuals, two or three, normally two burly men in a car, different cars at different times, following us around. They were following the family as well. And, you know, given um, we'd seen, or I'd seen the Nissan security department behave in a very, very egregious manner with others in terms of following and surveilling, I was very concerned as to what they were doing and who they were giving this information to. Um, because if they're giving this information to 
the authorities, you do think, why? What's going on here? I mean, this is just not normal behavior. And this all uh, culminated in a rather dramatic event uh, in the middle of uh, 2020. Who are you people? Where um, Nissan had uh, hired uh, a legal team and had obtained an unusual court order from the district court in Yokohama. To basically do a, a, a search and, and uh, of, of his home and seizure of his you know, corporate laptop and, and phone and other, and other documents. If you don't let us in now, we have to break this key. So it's a pretty extreme way to treat someone who spent 16 years at the company. These people have all come in. We don't really know who they are, apart from the fact that I've been shown a badge that says the Yokohama Court. And they're here to, re to recover a laptop and a mobile phone. It was even more weird <clears throat> because I'd highlighted to the directors that, they're, that certain Nissan executives were trying to recover this laptop and this phone whilst I was still in Japan. And I was very concerned because it had evidence on there that related to misconduct matters and other forms of inappropriate conduct. It was just an, another form of intimidation, another form of harassment, forcing me almost to leave the company and the country. Because once they'd retained and obtained these items, we were still followed which, again, I just couldn't understand. What is the point of doing that? You know, this is a, a car company. This is not the KGB. I think it's fair to say that Rob Posse didn't have full battlefield awareness of all the intrigue going on at Nissan. I mean, Hari Nada is interesting because he's both charismatic and charming and one of the most brutal corporate infighters one could ever run across. Uh, this is a confidential company email, right? You should not have this. If he had fallen into line, he would probably uh, still have his job at Nissan, uh, be paid uh, very well, and continue his work. A career that he spent you know, 16 years building at Nissan is, is irretrievably broken. It's been smashed to smith smithereens. Uh, he and his family you know, paid a huge price, certainly. Uh, but in terms of being able to sleep at night, I think uh, you know he's come out ahead. I highlighted issues to the highest levels of the company so that they could be dealt with appropriately by those in charge. There was no response to those, and there was retaliation against me. What's really profound, like absolutely profound, is that none of your colleagues, I mean people who you have known for years, forget it, yeah. you're on your own. Yeah. And um, yeah, you gotta be ready for that. You gotta be ready for that. If you take it on anyway.
this is the awful truth. There's always someone in the family that's pushing it. This lady does not deserve to be taken advantage of, especially at your age with your own grandchild. Yeah. My grandma is having to sue them. I'm testifying against them. Nobody's talking. They're one floor below right now. I get afraid to go on the elevator. It's sad that it had to devolve to this. It's, it's like a soap opera to me. It's a to very me. sad thing. It's a family feud. <laughs> a family feud. Here's a family that, on paper, you would think has the wealth that so many people seek, yet at the end of the day, it seemed to sort of rip everybody apart. Uh, my name is Tom Schoenberg. I'm a senior reporter here at Bloomberg News, cover financial enforcement. I was approached by someone close to the Schottenstein family and asked whether or not I would be interested in writing about Beverly Schottenstein and this case that she had against J.P. Morgan. And it was immediately clear that there was a great story here to be told. So I started just, you know, assembling all sorts of documents that the family made available to me that included a diary that Beverly had begun writing when she started having suspicions about what was actually going on with her money. Beverly obtained her wealth from the Schottenstein kind of retail empire that has at times included big lots, Value City, American Eagle Outfitters, DSW Shoes. Beverly's husband died, and at which point they sold off their portion of the company, bringing them an enormous amount of wealth in around 1990. Estimates of her wealth were around $90 million. She, for many years, had that pool of money being managed by outside advisors. Her grandsons in the late 2000s had both graduated and were becoming financial advisors. She gave them a little bit to work with, and over time, her grandson, Evan, became the trustee of her entire estate. Managing sort of family money uh, is not a conflict. In fact, some ways in wealth management, it's kind of how you get your start. It's kind of the seed that you need to sort of get going in the business. But Beverly started having suspicions that something was wrong probably in around 2016. Well, there were suspicious things, but taken separately without everyone talking about their own experiences, it was hard to really put it together. She had written a check to her caretaker, Dawn, that bounced. So she went down to her local Chase branch to sort of find out what was going on. She wasn't getting paper statements in the mail, so she asked them to print out a number of her statements having to do with her checking account and her credit card account. So we went to the bank and asked for the statements. And she got a whole year and going through all of them, page by page by page. And it was there she saw all sorts of charges that she said she didn't authorize or didn't know about. I was becoming very, very suspicious. I was starting to look in the money part, and that's what bothered me more when I saw that money was going. And I was not a big spender. Around the same time, Dawn, she starts noticing Beverly's son, who lived in the condominium below her, came up with Evan with a shredder and started grabbing papers in her office area, including some with J.P. Morgan letterhead, and just sat, started sitting at the kitchen table just shredding documents over and over. Yeah, they came in one morning. They used to do it in the back. Through the back door, and they brought this shredder inside. And then they went in the drawers in the office and took out all the papers, and they started doing it. I was very suspicious because I know you don't go around and get in destroying papers. Beverly said that they had done this many times before. That's when she said to me, you know, Dawn, I'm going to write my feelings in this black book. Diary. And it's a diary, and she started to write, and each day she would write a little at a time. Around the holidays of 2018, a package had arrived, a FedEx package, and in it 
were materials about a venture capital fund based out of the Cayman Islands. Dawn and some other family members take a look at this, and they see that Beverly is, is signed up for this fund to the tune of $5 million over the course of several years. And that was really the beginning of it. Um, that was that sort of the be. tip of the iceberg when it became obvious that something was going on that my grandmother really wasn't aware of this fund. You know, Beverly started to panic. She was, got really upset and called, you know, J.P. Morgan's headquarters in New York and asked for Jamie Dimon. Um, she said she was told someone would call her back, um, but she says that that never happened. She wrote a letter to uh, Evan and Avi, and in there she, she laid out a number of things that were concerning her. Unauthorized trading, the checking account. She had about a million dollars worth of jewelry in a safe deposit box, and that her son Bobby had the key to that box, and that, that jewelry had gone missing. All this was kind of packaged in this you know, five-page, handwritten amendment to a will and trust. There's such an evolving narrative about why the jewelry was taken. The only truth we really know is that the jewelry is gone. But why it happened, there have been a lot of different stories. You just don't take your mother's uh, wonderful things and hand it out. And they email that note to J.P. Morgan to seize all activity on her account. Oh, and it ended different. up setting off a firestorm after that. As soon as they got this email that there was a cease and desist and that she wanted to send her money uh, and change brokerage firms, they were actually vacationing one floor below downstairs. They're there right now. The next day, Beverly's in her, in her place. The granddaughter's still in, in, in her place visiting. Dawn is there, and up comes Bobby kind of barging through the door. And he's screaming about what was sent to J.P. Morgan. They're now investigating them. And he's furious, takes his mother and, and sort of puts her into a chair, gets pen and paper, and she says physically forced her to write a retraction letter. They were pushing me around. It was a scary time. I was really afraid, too. <laughs> I had to take her to the doctor, and she did an X-ray because she was in so much pain. The locks had to be changed. The phone number had to be changed. I really thought we were going to have to hire guards to be outside just for protection. Oh, it was, horrible, it was terrible. Horrible scene. Beverly brought her case before the Financial Industry Regulatory Authorities, usually known as FINRA. It took several months of hearings. She sees all sorts of transactions that's going on, hundreds of them that she claims that she never knew about, never authorized, but yet were logged in J.P. Morgan's files as having been direct requests from her. That included the sale of a large amount of Apple stock worth several million dollars, as well as all her stock in big lots. You know, over the course of the, their time with J.P. Morgan, Evan and Avi were making all sorts of trading on her account that was generating millions of dollars in commissions for themselves and the bank, yet she was not sort of getting any of the type of gains that you would expect sort of an $80 million account in a bullish market to be able to get. They issued a ruling entirely in her favor, finding that her grandsons, as well as J.P. Morgan, they were liable for violating their fiduciary duty, misrepresenting themselves, and they also found that uh, the bank and her grandson, Evan, were liable for elder abuse. Evan and Avi, they were fired from J.P. Morgan. They issued an award of about $19 million. I, I reached out for comment, and J.P. Morgan emphasized that Evan and Avi were no longer with the firm and that their actions do not represent the sort of values of the, of the bank. I reached out to Evan and Avi, heard back from their lawyer, saying that you know they disagree with you know, the law and the facts that FINRA kind of used to decide the case against them and are seeing if they can have it withdrawn. Her son, Bobby, wrote her a letter, said his sons weren't criminals, and he also admits to taking her jewelry. And he says he needed it to pay off some bad business debts he had. They never once came up to say, I'm sorry. If there had been an apology and some acceptance 
and 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 asking for forgiveness uh, from my grandmother, I don't think we'd be in the position that we are now. Since the piece came out, we've you know we received dozens of messages from people, uh, many of whom are telling their own sort of personal tales of. Uh, you know, kind of financial advisors gone bad or family members who got control of an estate and abused, uh, you know, those within. Seems that it's, it's really resonated with a lot of people. I keep, you know, hearing a lot of feedback about Beverly and how, you know, a lot of people feel she did the right thing. You're never too old to stand up for yourself and try to right an injustice. She was adamant that she wanted to stand up for herself. But at the end of the day, they did wrong. It's a painful life lesson. You know, Beverly taught them that you don't mess with grandma. April 20th, oil markets did something they never had before and they crashed, went into negative territory and closed the day at minus $40. Meanwhile, uh, in a place uh, called Thaden Voice in Essex, a group of nine traders led by a guy called Cuddles made $660 million over the course of a couple of hours. The price of oil has collapsed to a record low. We've never really seen anything like it. WTI this morning down more than 35%. People maybe wouldn't have been so surprised if the oil price had fallen to zero, but the oil price went to minus 38. It went far lower than anyone had expected. And so lots of people in the market were saying, well, hang on, something else is going on here. A couple of months later, I started to get wind through a kind of network of sources that a tiny firm in the outskirts of London had made a huge amount of money that day and potentially had some part to play in what happened. The information we got was that nine traders at Vega Capital London had made in the region of $660 million in one day. As a group, I think they made as much money in one day as Apple makes from its international sales in one day. I mean, it's an insane sum of money. Did they pull off a fantastic trade? Did they predict the way the market was moving and get it absolutely right? Or was there something else going on? And had they actually done something that breached market rules in a bid to, to sort of push the market? And that investigation is, is ongoing. So Paul Commons is uh, a trader who cut his teeth in, in the pits in the, the 80s and 90s. When everyone had a nickname, his was Cuddles. If you can imagine, that was a very sort of cutthroat type of world where people are doing, you know, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars trades by shouting at each other, giving hand signals and then sort of scrawling on scraps of paper. The culture of the trading pits in London was very influenced by uh, the, the working class guys who became traders there. They weren't like the city bankers that had gone before them. They weren't usually Oxford or Cambridge. You know, they didn't wear Savile Row suits. They were ordinary working guys who happened to have a talent for trading. And a lot of them came from Essex. I think it was 400 traders in the pits and cuddles in his you know, oil and gas pit was uh, described to us as amongst the top three among, you know, in amongst that, was very successful and, and made, you know, very large amounts of money as a, as a young man. But, you know, inevitably, uh, mechanization and the arrival of electronic markets um, was the kind of death knell for the pits. And in 2005, the IPE closed down. And when the pits shut down, uh, a lot of the traders who worked there lost their jobs or quit or went to work for financial institutions. But Paul Commons decided to start his own trading collective out in Essex.
Some of them are ex-pit guys, cut from the same cloth as him. Lots of them are actually sort of in their 20s, and they're his, you know, drinking buddy's son, or they're his own kid's friends from football. You know, they're, they're young lads, hungry and ambitious, and he brings them into the fold. And fairly shortly, he's got, um, you know, maybe a dozen or so traders. That are, they're independent, let's be clear, but they're all part of this collective. <laughs> yeah, let, I'll let Liam deal with Essex. I am from Essex, so I feel like I'm free to, uh, you know, to, <laughs> to get into this. Sweet, as they say. If you were to ask someone in Britain how they would imagine a, a kind of Essex person, they would see someone who's maybe some, slightly flamboyant, with a, a sort of Cockney accent, a sort of Guy Ritchie-style accent. <laughs> you know, not afraid to splash the cash, but it's probably pretty bright and has done well for themselves. Don't even make sense, does it? But, you know, these guys, they drove around very nice Rolls Royces and Bentleys. They went to uh, places like Marbella on holiday. Faden Boyce is a very wealthy place. You have to have considerable income to be able to afford to live in that village. It's a really nice place to live, and it's 20 minutes tube ride away from the city. Earlier in the summer, we have this lead, which is that there's this tiny firm called Vega Capital London, and they were the biggest winners from the biggest oil crash in history. You know, anyone that covers markets is going to be surprised about that. You know, you're thinking your BPs of the world or your Glencores, but there's this tiny firm. And one of the big challenges that we had was actually finding out who worked with Vega Capital. It wasn't immediately obvious, and at first we had absolutely no idea. Uh, if you go to the Vega Capital website, it says it's under construction. If you do basic online searching, it's very difficult to find anyone who's publicly connected to the company. So inevitably, we're incredibly curious at this point. Like, who the hell are these people? The more reporting we did, the more it became clear that this group were connected socially as well as professionally. They went to weddings together. They played golf together. They would go on holiday together. We found out that a number of them were members of the West Ham Supporters Club in London. A few of them started companies together, so you could see all the connections between them and start to see a distinct group emerging. And it really just was, was this kind of shock that, you know, this wasn't just like a hedge fund or a firm you'd never heard of. This was actually a group of buddies who all had the same experience on this day and had all made a huge amount of money. So if you're a, an oil trader, there's a number of different ways you can trade. And, and probably the most popular is WTI futures contracts. And it's basically a contract that says, I'm going to buy a thousand barrels of oil from you at this point in the future, or I'm going to sell a thousand barrels of oil to you at this point in the future. It's actually just a financial contract to gamble on to predict whether oil is going to go up or down. On the 20th of April in Essex, there have been signals for a while that this was going to be an exceptional day in oil markets. And we know that some of them arose early and started their trading in the early hours of the morning while it was still dark outside. Essentially what they were doing is buying contracts that gave them uh, an obligation to buy oil at whatever the price ended up at 2.30pm. So they're basically placing a bet that oil was going to fall throughout the day. But they're simultaneously selling lots of oil as well. And whether they make a profit and how much profit they make is the difference between what they buy the oil for and what they sell the oil for. Now, of course, we now know throughout uh, April 20th, the price dropped and dropped. So this is going very well for them. You know, they are committed to selling oil at these prices and the prices are continuing to fall, which means they're going to be able to offset it and buy oil at cheaper at the end of the day. Now, once it gets to kind of 1.30, 2 p.m., that's when things start to get really interesting. Suddenly, there's a kind of influx of, of buyers and sellers. You know, as sort of desperation increases in the market and trading volumes go up. Now, at 2.08 p.m. exactly, something bizarre and unprecedented happened, which is that oil passes into negative territory. And it fell to a record level of minus $38. We've never seen anything like it, period, in terms of the contraction uh, of the global economy. That huge gulf between what they were buying the oil for and what they were selling it for enabled them to make more money than they ever thought possible. So their profit was the difference between 
minus 37, and all of these positive numbers on every contract they sold. The price of crude briefly hit minus $37 a barrel. For one group of traders operating from a small office, it was a very, very profitable day. It's important to remember this, this had never happened before in the history of oil trading. No one could have predicted it. I can't think of another example of where you enter a trade and you get paid on both sides. You get paid both to sell and to buy. It, you know, it's unthinkable. One thing we know about uh, the Cuddles Trading Arcade is that they were very comfortable taking large risks. And, it, it, you know, you have to be clear, this was a large risk. Yeah, we spoke to oil traders, both people that know these guys and people that don't, and they all say that this is, you know, incredibly risky. And that's actually what stops a lot of oil traders doing trading like this. They simply aren't willing to stomach the risk. But Cuddles and his friends were. So when the kind of final calculations came down, the group of the nine most profitable traders made $660 million or thereabouts between them. I mean, if you can imagine, I think three or four of them made in excess of $100 million each. One of the astonishing things about this trade is that two of the individuals who made more than $100 million in a single day were in their 20s. One of them was 22 years old. You know, only a few years earlier, he'd been posting on his social media about doing teenage stuff with his mates in town and going to see girls and rap music and here he is a few years later making 100 million dollars in a single day's trading when me and liam discovered that we were just we couldn't believe it we couldn't believe what we were seeing oil trading is a, is a zero-sum game anytime you're making money as an oil trader someone else is losing it amongst the biggest losers were the investors in this chinese fund crude oil treasure fund um, there were thousands of them, and they lost everything. Lots of people had put their savings into oil funds. They lost money that day. Uh, big banks and brokers who sort of stand in the middle of trading parties, they lost money that day. And another interesting thing is that oil-producing countries like Kuwait or Canada, um, they sell oil to, as, as a, an average of the WTI closing price over the preceding month. So the fact that one of those numbers in that average was minus 37 meant, if you can imagine, countries like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait potentially lost a couple of dollars on every single barrel of oil they sold that month. Vega Capital's traders made such an extraordinary sum of money that it was inevitable there would be some scrutiny of what they did. But it wasn't just the sums of money they made. In the vital half an hour before the settlement price was set, they were by far the biggest sellers of oil futures in the market, which is an incredible thing to think about when you consider that the other participants in that oil market are gonna be the world's biggest banks, you know, oil majors, BP and Shell, and here you have a group of nine guys in Essex who are having this significant influence over a global market for oil. I mean, I think you have to assume that if these guys had made $7 million or $10 million, they probably would be celebrating in Essex right now. But the fact that they made closer to $700 million has meant that they are facing understandable scrutiny. We wrote individually to uh, all, the, all the Vega traders who did exceptionally well that day, and we got a, a letter in response from a law firm representing the group. Uh, and the law firm was at pains to point out, number one, that they haven't been accused of any wrongdoing, um, that they all traded independently and separately, and they'd basically all made up their own minds that this was what was going to happen in oil markets based on publicly available knowledge, and decided to execute this trade. What I love about these stories is there's a real variance of opinion. And some people will look at what happened and think, that must be dodgy. They all traded at the end of the day. They all made a huge amount of money while all these people lost. That's shocking. But lots of people say, these guys are at acute disadvantage. They're in a market that's inhabited by, you know, huge technology-driven funds and firms and oil giants that have got all the advantages in the world and when you get a bunch of Essex geezers who essentially beat the market and find a way to make a huge amount of money they should get a pat on the back really because that's the dream since this happened a lot of the guys have stopped trading the monthly settlements that they've done so well at in the past several of them have set up new companies they've essentially gone very quiet you know, any kind of social media presence they had is, is, is kind of closed down. By all accounts, they're, you know, waiting this out.
It's certainly too early to try and predict how the regulatory investigations are going to pan out. You know, we just don't know. There's a number of potential outcomes for these guys. You know, potential punishments if there are any findings of manipulation against Vega or anyone affiliated with it might be you could be fined, uh, you could be banned from trading, and, you know, in the most extreme cases, there have even been criminal prosecutions in the past of uh, of people who have been found to have been manipulating the settlement and uh, misconduct related to, to trade at settlement. There are other outcomes too. You know, one, one obvious one is going to be that they're able to walk away from this life-changing trade with all the money that they made and celebrated as heroes in the trading community. That you know, They'll go down as legends. of the climate crisis right now for the general public to have an understanding of what progress is or is not actually happening. And I think many readers right now, they'll see these hundreds and hundreds of companies making these uh, big, bold climate uh, claims. And they would be forgiven to think that, you know, we're well on our way to meeting the emission reduction trajectory we need to be on. And the reality of the matter is we're just not on that trajectory. And a, uh, and a key a reason for this sort of disconnect is the use of offsets that aren't doing what they claim to be doing. We have a massive potential for sort of willful blindness. We can convince ourselves of things regardless of what the facts are. And so that's what tends to happen in these cases. It's not that, it's not that anybody is setting out to commit climate fraud. They, they sort of walk themselves into a situation and they convince themselves of one thing and that allows them to convince themselves of another thing. But at the end of the day, they're doing something that makes no sense at all. My name is Ben Elgin. I wrote the story about how the billion dollar market for carbon offsets is setting back the fight against climate change. So one of the challenges in reporting on carbon offsets and trying to figure out what's going on is really finding good uh, experts who who have been steeped in this marketplace and are willing to candidly talk about it. Uh, One of the best people for this is a fellow named Mark Trexler, and I've been talking to him for more than a decade. My name is Mark Trexler. I've worked in climate change for the last 30 years. Uh, I was actually hired by the World Resources Institute in Washington to work on the first carbon offset project in 1988. In terms of defining a carbon offset, the, one of the beauties, so to speak, of greenhouse gases, sort of the silver lining of greenhouse gases, you can, when you put up a molecule of CO2 into the atmosphere, it can be anywhere in the planet in seven days. And therefore, you know, if there's an option to reduce emissions on the other side of the planet, and you can do that very cheaply as compared to doing it in your factory, for example, then why not pay that person, that factory on the other side of the planet to reduce their emissions? Then you are, in a sense, offsetting your emissions, and the atmosphere doesn't really see your emissions anymore. So carbon offsets have been been around for quite some time, and they were actually key with these international uh, climate agreements, such as the Kyoto Protocol, which mandated the wealthiest countries reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. The treaty was signed on the 11th of December, 1997. Decided. The business community in general saw carbon offsets as a huge opportunity to comply with whatever policies and measures might be coming down the pike on climate change much more cost-effectively. We've seen a, a huge surge in companies 
uh, making big proclamations about how they're going carbon neutral or zeroing out all of their carbon emissions. We're going to reduce our carbon footprint to net zero. Unilever is committing to net zero emissions. We can achieve a net zero emissions world. We began looking at these corporate claims of, of dramatically reduced emissions, and we noticed so many of these companies were using carbon offsets to, uh, to, to achieve these aims. And as we began to look at the carbon offset projects themselves, what we found is that the environmental benefits claimed by these companies are not actually what they, what they seem to be. And as we sort of saw and spotted a number of these very aggressive carbon offset projects, which appeared to be generating inflated credits or bogus credits, we saw a number of them were associated with the Nature Conservancy. And this surprised us. The Nature Conservancy is the world's biggest environmental group. Uh, they have about a billion dollars a year in revenues. Uh, and they've been around for seven decades. Uh, they've preserved about 125 million acres of land. Uh, and, and they've done so many good works over the years. And they've been very strong in terms of working with corporate partners. The Nature Conservancy has taken a different approach, a very pragmatic and pro-business approach. They will not go out and criticize a big polluter, but they're very happy to work with them. Uh, some might say that, well, that's selling out. Um, but others would say, and, and those at the Nature Conservancy would say, uh, these companies have deep pockets. They can help fund important preservation work, and we have absolutely no problem working with them on this stuff. So uh, companies are uh, very warm, and, and um, they've partnered with the Nature Conservancy for, for many years. And uh, yeah, it definitely lends a, a sheen of credibility to these projects. Here's 20 new reasons to visit Disney World this year. <laughs> Uh, if you look at, for instance, Disney, that's a, a sprawling company with theme parks and, and cruise lines that burn up diesel fuel. Uh, they have office buildings and television studios that consume electricity. Uh, so these companies are trying to make major, major reductions in their carbon footprints, but it's very difficult to change these fundamental ways their businesses operate. So Disney has been a big buyer of carbon offsets that are uh, orchestrated by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, one of the projects that they buy from is called Pennsylvania Ridges. Uh, and that's a plot of land. Most of the land is actually about uh, a three hour drive outside of Philadelphia. Um, interestingly, this land, 3,000 of these acres, was actually acquired by the Nature Conservancy in the late 1990s. Um, this land was imminently threatened. There was a pending logging contract on this land. So they, they do what they, they've done so well for all of these years, which is they go out, they raise money from local philanthropists, and they go buy this land to protect it from developers and loggers. And at the time, according to an archived version of the Nature Conservancy's website, uh, they, when they were proudly announcing this deal, they said, uh, these threats have been abated because of this acquisition by the Nature Conservancy. So it's really interesting now, fast forward two decades to earlier this year when they put forward this carbon project. And if you look through it, this land is a key part of that carbon project. And what they're now saying is this land is now once again imminently threatened. 72% uh, of the trees are gonna be cut within five years. Now this is just astounding because this land is owned by the Nature Conservancy. They do not clear cut land that they've bought through philanthropic donations. Uh, so this scenario that they've put forward to get carbon revenues is not really plausible. And what that means is when you have Disney coming in and, and buying these credits, when it eventually lowers its carbon footprint because of these credits, well that won't be a credible or truthful claim by Disney. So uh, this, is, this is an organization that truly understands the, the threat of the issue of, of climate change and is wanting to do its part to address this. Uh, however, in this situation, it just appears their, their drive, which they've had for decades, to increase the amount of revenues that it can use for land preservation work, 
uh, Nature Conservancy and many others see that uh, carbon credits as a pot of money that they can tap into to uh, further their own uh, benevolent aims. Uh, but unfortunately, what this has resulted in is claims of climate progress that just aren't really happening. So the Nature Conservancy uh, defends vigorously these deals, and, and they and, and others will say, look, our projects are just following the rules that these registries set up. Um, so some would also put some of the blame on the registries themselves because they're setting up the rules which allow these vapid projects to get up and sold. So we've reached out to all of the companies we mentioned in this story, including Disney. They didn't want to be interviewed for this story, but they all told us that, look, uh, we have to rely on the experts out there. And those experts, they say, are these carbon registries that have been set up. Most of these Nature Conservancy deals are uh, set up and sold on this exchange. It's called the American Carbon Registry. Now, it's the oldest of these registries that uh, allow uh, voluntary carbon credits to be sold. They've been around since 1996. What these offset registries do is they set up rules, and any carbon offset project has to follow those rules. But there's this tension that's always there. If the rules are too strict, uh, then it's going to be very hard for carbon offset projects to get up and running. So there's this, this balance going on where the registries want rules that attract projects, but they don't want it to be so strict where it will uh, disincentivize projects from getting listed. One of the, the challenges with, with designing carbon offset systems is that there are normally two people at the table. You have buyers and you have sellers. And to some extent, you have policymakers, but but you know the buyers and the sellers are really the ones with the expertise, with the with the incentive to really participate hard, make a lot of things happen. Uh, and the the challenge there is is that both of them sort of want the same thing, or they're both happy with the same thing. They're happy with low cost offsets and a lot of them, because that works for their business model. You end up though with nobody really representing the atmosphere, so to speak. Nobody's really representing the climate in those discussions. And so the policies end up biasing the whole system and, and you, you end up in sort of a race to the bottom. And that's what we've seen happen. Now, when it comes specifically to the topic of carbon offsets, you know, I, I am a fan of carbon offsets in the sense that they can help mitigate climate change. They absolutely can. But you know, if we're not going to do it correctly in a way that actually does help mitigate climate change, then it's nothing but a distraction. And you know, after 30 years, you have to start wondering, is it really just a distraction? And that's really unfortunate, but that's where we are. Ultimately, what needs to, be, what needs to happen is systemic change. You know, we're, we're sort of nibbling around the edges with some of these different things. We need to change how we produce energy. We need to change how we transport ourselves. We need to change what and how we eat. You know, we, we need systemic change associated with transitioning to a low carbon economy. A lot of what we're doing today is not promoting systemic change. It's sort of trying to stick your, your, your thumb in the dike uh, to preserve the current system. And, and at the end of the day, that can't really work.
the Hyperloop. There's a good chance you've heard the name by now. This is the Hyperloop system. It can take people hundreds of miles and minutes. The Hyperloop, a series of tubes that would transport people in pods at ultra high speeds over long distances. This is a remarkable new form of transportation that can whisk people from city to city in a flash. 29 minutes from New York to DC, 30 minutes from LA to San Francisco. For years, we've been seeing these futuristic utopian renderings of some cross between a spaceship and a monorail. But lately, the Hyperloop is becoming much more real. Yes. It was surreal to be even sitting inside a Hyperloop and just even more incredible to actually be like riding down a track in something that was nothing more than a crazy idea six years before. Companies all around the world have been developing and testing the technology needed to propel passengers at speeds of over 1,000 kilometers per hour. But for many, speed is only the first step to unlocking the full transformational effects of a new mode of transportation. Fast is what we just sort of take for granted in the Hyperloop world. It's the network effects that really deliver the benefit. And that opens up a completely different scale of economic opportunity. called the Hyperloop. The Hyperloop? Uh, Hyperloop, yeah. In 2013, while riding high on the growing success of Tesla and SpaceX, entrepreneur Elon Musk released a white paper outlining the basic framework of the technology he called Hyperloop. The basic idea goes a little something like this. A tube reduces the air pressure to a near vacuum-like environment. A Hyperloop pod is then suspended in the tube, usually by magnetic levitation. The whole pod can then be propelled forward. Because there's no traditional friction sources like air resistance or rolling friction that would push back against the pod, the Hyperloop is able to move at incredibly high speeds and do so fairly efficiently. Despite its futuristic name, however, the general concept behind Hyperloop is actually pretty old. In fact, New York City's first attempt at an underground public transit system in the 1870s was based on a similar principle. The pneumatic transit system was short-lived, however, only stretching one block and topping out at a rather leisurely 10 miles per hour. While Elon would make some 21st century improvements to this concept and bestow a very 21st century name, he wouldn't end up pursuing the technology itself, instead electing to focus his efforts on something a little bit deeper, literally digging the requisite tunnels via his boring company. It would take another billionaire industrialist who dabbles in spaceflight. No, wait, not that one. Yeah, that's the one. After Richard Branson would make a large investment in the company Hyperloop One, it would be renamed to Virgin Hyperloop. What we've always been trying to do as a company is show that this technology could work, that it could be made safe, and that ultimately it's something that's happening in the next couple of years, not the next 20 years. Josh Geigel is the co-founder and CEO of Virgin Hyperloop. In a familiar tech startup story, he's seen the project go from a garage to a large-scale testing facility outside of Las Vegas. So we started building the first kind of Hyperloop system in 2016. We've done a lot of work, about 500 tests that we've done on that over the last five years. And what we realized that we need to do is take that technology, show that it can be commercial, so drive the cost down, improve the efficiency, improve the performance. But the key thing is, you know, is actually making it approachable and safe for individuals. In order to do that, Josh, along with Virgin's head of passenger experience, Sara Lucian, bravely volunteered to take the inaugural ride. What her and I were realizing is like, we're the first two people sitting in a hyperloop. The only type of people that have gone through this environment are in spacesuits, and there we are in just like normal clothes because of the system, the safety of what we've designed. Three, two, one, launch. And then once we started going, uh, you felt a bit of acceleration. We accelerated a little bit harder than we would in commercial, It'd be like a sports car. Yes. Yes. We got up to about 108 miles an hour on that test. Uh, and it's a short run, it's about 500 yards or so and came to a stop. 
The test, lasting only about 20 seconds and covering only a quarter of a mile at just over 100 miles per hour, is a long way away from a true functioning hyperloop. But as for optics, it's a crucial step for the future of funding. The number one question we got from investors or from project proponents or just people in general was like, is the hyperloop safe? And what better way to show something is safe than by actually getting people on it? But convincing investors and governments that would likely be fronting some of the construction costs for an unproven technology is no easy task. First and foremost is the question of safety. Most people don't know how an airplane works, but yet they get on an airplane. They get on an airplane because, you know, it's faster than driving. And most importantly, they've probably gotten off of one before. They've seen someone get off of one before. And so what we set out to do was actually show that Hyperloop could be safe with two normal people, not astronauts, not adrenaline junkies or, or test pilots or anything like that. Two normal people getting on a Hyperloop. And then most importantly, those two people getting off. But beyond safety concerns, constructing Hyperloops will undoubtedly require a significant capital investment to the estimated tune of around 60 million US dollars per kilometer of track. So a track from San Francisco to Los Angeles, for example, is likely to come with a price tag over $10 billion. And before large governments are willing to come in and front those costs, investors who are funding Hyperloop development must accept it as a long-term mixture of technology and infrastructure investing. Investors that are used to short returns because you're developing apps or something to that effect, you know, those aren't the investors that really get excited about Hyperloop. What you start to see is the people that are looking at platform technologies, right? So this idea that because this smartphone existed, Uber could exist, right? So who are like the Vanderbilts of this century? And that's the part where you're going to get a lot more no's than yeses. But those people that have the ability, the, the fortitude to stick it out, to see the game-changing platform here, those are the people that we're looking for. And since we've done that passenger test, there has been a lot of interest that's really, oh, this is a lot sooner than I thought. Envisioning the ripple effects of what Hyperloop could achieve, though, is fairly challenging at this stage of development. It's fast, yes, but for point-to-point -point travel, traditional maglev trains can move pretty fast as well. And outside of China, South Korea, and Japan, even those haven't seen much adoption elsewhere due to the high costs and questionable profitability. The Shanghai Line in China, for example, loses around $100 million every year. Hyperloop companies, however, believe they can offer something different than traditional railway lines. My name is Alan James, and as far as I know, uh, I'm the only guy on the planet who's written a government-level business case for 300 kmh conventional high-speed rail, 500 kmh maglev, and 1,000 kmh Hyperloop. It's fundamentally about moving people from where they are to where they want to go, when they want to make those journeys, and doing it in much smaller numbers. So pod designs uh, for Hyperloop range from 12 to 28 seats, typically. Why are they small? It's because small enables the network to operate flexibly. And a, a great example of that is the east-west strategic route across the north of England from Liverpool to Manchester to Leeds. So to get from Liverpool via Manchester to Leeds by train is just short of two hours today. It'll probably take you two hours driving as well in, in average traffic conditions. Net result is those three city regions remain three separate entities, Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds. There's very little commuting traffic between those uh, areas. Hyperloop absolutely changes that from the ground up. Liverpool to Manchester is a five or six minute journey. Manchester to Leeds is also a five or six minute journey. What that effectively does 
is create a single super city economy. In this vision, the Hyperloop acts a little more like a highway, where pods have fixed destinations and don't need to stop along the way. Meaning you can travel on a Hyperloop network from, say, Liverpool to Leeds, while the pod behind you travels from Liverpool to Manchester. And if that metro Hyperloop network is connected to other networks from the same location, you could travel from Liverpool to Paris or Liverpool to Amsterdam, all without making a single stop. For passengers, for business, for leisure, that is utterly transformational. For high-value freight and logistics, it's equally transformational. But critically, if you do a Hyperloop network at scale, you begin to deliver massively significant carbon savings too. A multi-regional Hyperloop network could become a replacement for both short-haul passenger and cargo flights and traditional ground transportation, both of which are significant carbon producers. One Hyperloop-connected distribution hub, perhaps at an airport that is predominantly used for international air freight, replacing maybe 10, 12, 15 distributed road hubs. It takes a lot of polluting and inefficient truck haulage off the roads. That itself means roads gain extra capacity. Hyperloops will still need to use electricity to both move pods and maintain the near vacuum environment in the tube. Proponents of the technology believe that this can be done by using renewable sources, including a combination of solar panels and battery technology that could be used along the Hyperloop itself. But even with all multipliers of time and carbon emission savings that a Hyperloop network may provide, the investment capital required to actually build such a network becomes even more economically and politically daunting. Committing doesn't mean spending billions on day one. Committing means, how do we phase it? One company in the Netherlands is working to develop that technology, and perhaps more importantly, the international coalition needed to make the Hyperloop network a reality. So we are here in Europe's first full-scale Hyperloop test facility, where we can already prove every conceptual technology of the Hyperloop. This is Tim Howder, a co-founder and CEO.